All right, um, we need now have a quorum and we'll begin the COPRAC meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Before I do the roll call, we ask that anyone who plans on giving public comments to use the raise hand function to indicate you'd like to do so. Now with permission of the chair, I'll do the roll call. Yes, please. Justin Fields. Here. Ken Bacon. Here. Sarah Banola. Here. Elizabeth Bradley. Cassidy Chivers. Toby Inlander. Brandon Kruger. Here. Joel Mark. Here. Eleanor Mercado. Bill Munoz. Here. Dina Roach. Here. Kyla Rowe. And Hunter Starr. Here. Thank you. So um, I will repeat again, if there's anybody who would like to give public comment, please use the raise hand function to indicate you'd like to do so. Okay, it looks like we have quite a few commenters. We may have to limit the public comment to one minute today for each speaker. Okay, it is now a good time for me to um, give an introduction before we start the public comment, Mimi, or do you wanna wait another? If you'd like to do so, it's up to you. Great. Um, so uh, I understand we have a, a number of public commenters today and uh, I would anticipate that many of those uh, commenters um, would like to discuss the um, campaign contribution issue with respect to district attorneys. I just wanna say thank you to those who are um, here to comment. We, we appreciate your public comments. Uh, we appreciate that this is an important issue and um, we wanna make sure that we can hear from as, as many uh, of you as possible and, and um, un understand um, the, the points that you'd like to make. However, because there are so many public commenters and because of the, the time constraints that we have um, in our meetings, uh, we would ask that you please limit your comments to one minute. And if you um, would like to endorse or if you agree with a, a commenter who has already spoken, rather than repeating what that commenter has said, we'd very much appreciate if you either raise your hand in the Zoom application uh, or let us know when your name is called that you endorse that view rather than repeating it. And that will give us the opportunity to get through as many public commenters as possible um, with the time that we have. Okay. With that, um, I will start with Elena Matthews. Elena, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Alana Matthews. Thank you for this opportunity. I just wanna say that um, I support this measure because district attorneys will undoubtedly review use of force incidents involving police officers. And when they do, the financial and political support of the association representing the individual under investigation should not be allowed. And with that, I will end my comments. Thank you. Thank you. We should be underway here. And uh, next, we have Wade Stern. Wade, you'll need to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning. My name is Wade Stern, and I'm the current president of the Federated University Police Officers Association. Our union represents approximately 300 police officers within the University of California system from San Diego all the way up to Sacramento. The reason I'm calling today is express my organization's strong opposition to agenda item D2, the proposal that would bar law enforcement unions from contributing to candidates for district attorney. I've, I've gotta be honest with you, I feel annoyed, I feel bothered, and most of all, I actually feel extremely disappointed in this committee because once again, I have to come to you again to defend the rights of police officers and police officers unions. This should have been done and dealt and uh, dealt and done with, and I hope that we can finally put this behind us today. I say it again: Should we silence teachers who are looking to vote on their school board members? Should we not allow teachers' unions to, to donate to super 
to, to superintendents, where do we draw the line? Uh, that decision, who gets to have the voice and who doesn't? I beg of you, I beg of you to not be political pawns to those who are trying to suppress our First Amendment rights. It's unethical, your it's biased to bar police unions. I, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, JJ Publisi. Good morning. This is JJ Publisi. I'm president of the Burbank Police Officers Association. And uh, it's interesting that the previous caller wants to uh, bar police officers from exercising their First Amendment rights, yet I'm sure is happy to have activists contribute uh, to DAs that uh, would also make these decisions and try to influence them in their favor. So I would, uh, I would encourage the state bar to not uh, approve of this measure. I think it's a slippery slope. And uh, when we start muzzling the voices of people to exercise their First Amendment rights and who they support politically, I think that uh, it just degrades our democracy and uh, deprives uh, little by little uh, folks of exerting some sort of influence over the political process. Let the voters decide. Two seconds remaining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mike Nicolini. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Nicolini. I'm the president of the Vallejo Police Officers Association. Um, and in, in the interest of time, and I spoke uh, back in uh, December as well, um, uh, I am calling to express my organization's opposition uh, to agenda item D2 um, for all the same reasons that um, I'm sure you'll hear after me and, and I'm sure you've already heard. Um, you know, it's it in a time when when law enforcement is, is under attack across the nation, um, this just seems like one more um, uh, attempt to uh, silence uh, police officers and and expect more out of us than anybody else uh, in society. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Joseph Iniguez. Iniguez. Hi, good morning. I'm Joseph Iniguez. I'm the chief of staff for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. I'm calling in favor of agenda item D2. And I'd like to just stress that um, the point here is to not restrict law enforcement organizations from contributing to district attorneys, but that when they do, the district attorney who receives money from those law enforcement organizations should recuse themselves from any investigations involving um, that organization. So Really what we want to get here is um, the point that district attorneys themselves are personally involved in the decision-making matters when it involves use of force, including officer-involved shootings. Um, other decisions that are made throughout the department are generally handled without the direct involvement of the elected district attorney. So what we're asking that is that district attorneys recuse themselves on these critical matters because the reality is that law enforcement organizations have an outsized influence on district attorney races through the money that they contribute to these candidates. So we just wanna make it more clean, remaining. build trust within the community that these DAs are acting independent of any uh, contributions they receive. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Jeff Swearingen. Jeff, you'll need to unmute yourself. My apologies. Hello, my name is Jeff Swearingen, president of the PC Lima, Placer County Law Enforcement Management Association um, in Placer County. I'm actually surprised um, and concerned that your first speaker, as well as the last speaker, uh, were not aware that DA review of use of force cases is less than 1% of what they spend their time on. And if there are conflicts of interest, there are rules in play that all DAs are required to follow. Uh, I'm calling to express PC Lima's opposition to item D2. Um, as stated during your first previous meeting, this is an attempt to silence the voice of law enforcement and violate our First Amendment rights. It's discriminatory for those called upon to serve in this noble and proud profession. Uh, prohibiting participation of law enforcement associations to have a voice in critical DA elections directly affecting public safety while allowing special interest groups to have their voice and influence for DA candidates is a transparent attempt to silence us. If the bar wishes to prohibit LA associations from contributing to a DA candidate, then the bar should also make the fair, right, ethical, transparent decision seconds remaining. to prohibit all contributions, including private donations or endorsements for those seeking the office of DA. 
I urge you to reject, reject this blatant bias and partisan attempt to silence those representing the proud individuals who are trying to make our Your state a better place to live, work, and visit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, Nick Odenoff. You're able to hear me okay? Yes. Oh, well, good morning. My name is Nick Odenoff, and I'm the president of the Ventura County Deputy Sheriff's Association. I represent approximately 800 sworn law enforcement officers in Ventura County. And I am also calling to express my organization's opposition to agenda item D2. The proposal would bar law enforcement un unions from contributing to candidates for a district attorney. Uh, we believe that the request is a clear violation of our First Amendment right and is designed to limit and undermine the author's opponents to amplify the voices of their supporters. I urge you to reject this incredibly biased request to silence uh, union voices representing the men and women in California's law enforcement community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Natasha Minsker. Good morning. My name is Natasha Minsker. I am an attorney and consultant representing the Prosecutors Alliance of California in their state work. I wish to provide the committee additional background on SD 710, authored by Senator Bradford, which sought to address the recurring conflict of interest that occurs when law enforcement makes financial donations to district attorney candidates. SB 710 passed the Senate by a significant margin and passed the Assembly Public Safety Committee. The committee analysis recognized that there is a gap in current law and ethical rules regarding campaign contributions received by district attorneys. The committee analysis also recognized the government has a compelling state interest in ensuring that there's no actual or perceived conflict of interest in the administration of justice and in ensuring that the criminal laws are equally and fairly applied to all. The bill ultimately was held in the Appropriations Committee due to concerns around costs, ironically, because the Department of Justice recognized that there are many conflicts that would lead to uh, increased workload for the Department of Justice. Given the recognition of the gap in law and that this can be corrected consistent with the First Amendment, I urge the State Bar to take action and address this issue. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, Christine Soto de Berry. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity. I want to emphasize that this is not a restriction on contributions. There are still independent expenditure contributions that remain available. Rather, this is a conflict of interest rule specific to elected prosecutors in cases that demand the greatest independence from their closest professional partnership, the police. The relationship is too close for comfort when it comes to officers being accused of crimes and layering financial contributions to their personal campaigns creates a conflict in an already close working relationship. In my more than decade overseeing the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, I saw up close how unique the officer involved cases are and the need for more independence in the evaluation and separation from the entity often paying the legal bills. Ten Unlike seconds, other maybe. cases in our system, the police associations are involved in the investigation, the representation, the political discourse, and the district attorney, him or herself, often has You're personal decision-making in these cases. It is, we need more independence. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, next we have Damon Kurtz. Oh, there, you there you go. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Damon Kurtz. I'm the Vice President of uh, Peace Officers Research Association California, otherwise known as PORAC, representing over 76,000 members across the state, uh, most of them in law enforcement. Um, we also are strongly opposed to uh, Agenda D2. We believe this is a blatant attempt by the authors of this motion to silence the constitutionally protected voices of our political opponents. Um, I believe this is uh, possibly unconstitutional. I think maintaining the neutrality of the state bar is paramount in serving its primary functions of licensing, regulation, and discipline of the attorneys. Uh, this does the opposite. Uh, I'll try and be quick here. Uh, you know, I guess we have to ask, you know, using this characteristics of a donor to as a prerequisite for participation in the democratic process represents an abandonment of the bar's neutrality. 
where does it stop? It's law enforcement today, other unions next year. Is it special interest groups? Uh, like intervening. You? Uh, there's a reason we have both. And IEs are not transparent. Uh, this process is. It allows everybody to know who supports the person. Uh, a fancy name on an IE committee. Your, makes your time is up. Research. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have Michael Hastings. Michael, you'll Good morning. Meet yourself. Good there morning, you. commissioners. My name is Michael Hastings. I'm the president of the Burbank Police Foundation, former mayor of Burbank, and I strongly oppose uh, this uh, agenda item, mainly because I look at this as the tip of the iceberg. If we are going to start discriminating against donors to uh, district attorneys, should we possibly then start limiting lawyers to uh, contributing toward their campaigns. I think it's an, an it's an open book. People know who contribute to who, and I would not to see this seat like to see this set a precedent. Thank you very much, and and I trust your judgment as to being in favor of what's fair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Rob Taylor. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, I'm Rob Taylor. I'm president of the Los Angeles School Police Management Association. I'm also a uh, licensed attorney and a member of the state bar. I want to strongly uh, express my union's opposition to 2D. I believe that this is a political agenda move to limit the voices of police unions. I also understand that as attorneys have ethic rules and conflict of interest where they can recuse themselves. We do not need this. This is a attempt to silence the voice of unions. And this is the beginning of a slippery slope, should this pass, to, as other people have said, to limit teachers from contributing to school boards. And where does this stop? I urge you to vote no on TV. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have MJ King. Good morning, this is MJ King calling in support of this proposal. It's time for prosecutors to promote equity in the criminal legal system. DAs that accept money from law enforcement should recuse themselves from investigating officer misconduct. As a reminder, this is, restric this is a restriction on the prosecutor and not the free speech of these groups. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next we have Brian Zimajewski. Very good, Zimieski. Zimieski, sorry. Uh, I am the current president of the San Diego District Attorney Investigator Association, and I represent about 135 members. So I'll make a couple quick points. I am the president of a very small association, and one of the good things about us is that we can ban our voice to become a louder voice so that we can be heard in Sacramento and other places. If you bar us from doing that, we will not have a loud a voice. Second thing is I usually always read the state bar's recommendations for judges. I do that because I think you guys are very independent. If you are going to stop allowing donations, how can I believe that when you support a judge and give them a favorable reading evaluation, how can I believe that if you're not going to allow me to do my Thing also. 10 seconds remaining. Thank you. And I believe yeah. you guys will probably be the leaders of the state. If I can't donate to a DA, I'm sure the attorneys will stop donating to judges. Thank you. Next, we have Adrian Carpenter. Good morning. My name is Adrian Carpenter, and I'm representing the Prosecutors Alliance of California. I think it's very important to know that unlike other cases handled by a prosecutor's office, <clears throat> use of force issues are personally reviewed by the elected district attorney. This is not a restriction on speech. This is a restriction on the prosecutor only. These groups can, these groups can still contribute as they did before, but they will not be able to have the cozy relationship with the prosecutor's office as they have had before. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Carl Huber. 
Hello, my name is Carl Huber. I'm the president of the San Rafael Police Association. I just wanted to register our opposition to agenda item D2. It appears to be an attempt to silence the groups responsible for maintaining public safety in the communities that they serve. And seriously, um, I think it's lacking in objectivity with regard to um, how it's applied to law enforcement groups. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Marshall McLean. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Marshall McClay, good morning. Thank you. I represent Los Angeles Airport Peace Officer Association. And uh, we are opposed to this as we were the other two times that this came forward. I think it's pretty ridiculous that it's taken three times to do this. The facts are still the same. Uh, and look at who's pushing this, the uh, progressive group that's pushing it, that's currently being recalled and having their employees come out here and talk about how it's not going to limit anybody's voice. We already know that what it is. Look what's going on in San Francisco. Look what's going on in L.A. County. Both of these are from these progressive rules that have really screwed up the state. And so try to take the police officers unions and the district attorneys and, dis and, and all the other unions together to try to limit their their ability to uh, donate to these groups because they want them out because they weren't be doing they weren't doing what everybody wants them to do in the state. Ten so seconds remaining. We've talked about this. You have the facts. The other two hearings, we shouldn't take a fourth hearing to do this, to decide on it. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mary Kay Ellen Seged. You'll need to unmute yourself, Mary Kay. Hello. Yes. Hey, <clears throat> my name is uh, Mara Kay Ellen Seged. I'm calling on behalf of Black Lives Matter LA and Black Alliance for Just Immigration. And I'm calling in support of this, um, this bill because it is so clear that the most blatant kind of conflict of interest is when prosecutors are able to try a case um, that they're accepting money from police organizations from. Um, this is 100% going to be, this is 100% meant to protect community members from, um, from the possibility of a conflict of interest that prevents true justice from being served and prevents the, the the prosecutors and the courts from having a fair trial and community members from having a fair trial. So I support this motion, we support this motion. And um, the people, if you look at the people who are opposed to this motion- 10 seconds people, remaining. These are people who have Blue Lives Matter flags stamped on their things. And um, yeah, the supporting this bill would support black lives. Thank you. Next we have Fern Pearson. Good morning. Uh, this is Vern Pearson. I'm the immediate past president of the California District Attorneys Association, representing the vast majority of prosecutors here in the state of California. Uh, uh, unlike many of the activists that are seeking to uh, have this change in the rule, uh, I've also previously uh, worked as a deputy attorney general. And as I've raised in the past with this group, as well as the others, that there is an entire body of law dealing with conflict of interest, that the AG's office is, is fully capable of taking over conflict cases as I did as a deputy attorney general uh, when there was an actual conflict. This is uh, attempting nothing more than an attempt by activists to bring the state bar into this activist role of uh, uh, villainizing lo local law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. Next, we have Aaron Reed. Hi, uh, members of the committee, Aaron Reed, representing California Association of Highway Patrolmen, uh, 14,000 active and retired CHP officers who all voluntarily belong to the association, 99.5% membership. Uh, they're vigorously opposed to this uh, for all the reasons mentioned by the other opponents. I won't you know, duplicate them, but every single argument was valid. We urge you in, to reject this proposal. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kat, uh, Kate Chatfield. 
Thank you. Um, I'm calling. Um, I'm the acting chief of staff for San Francisco District Attorney uh, Chase Boudin, and I join in the comments of Joseph Benigas, Natasha Minsker, Christine DeBerry, Adrian Carpenter, and others in support of a rule um, that would um, require district attorneys to recuse themselves um, if they receive law enforcement contributions. Um, I can say for our office, um, these cases are um, reviewed at the highest level. We decline to prosecute many, many more uh, cases involving police officers than we choose to prosecute, but all people deserve <clears throat> to know that they're those who are acting in the name of the people of the state of California are exercising this incredible authority without favor to any donor or to any special relationship that the elected district attorney has. Um, in response remaining. to the last comment, um, the attorney general only reviews upon request of the district attorney. This rule would change that. Thank you. Uh, we have Aaron Reed again. I don't know if that's a duplicate or a different Aaron Reed. I'm gonna assume it's a duplicate. Um, next, uh, lastly, we have Mark Zabo. Uh, Max Zabo, sorry, I apologize. No, you're fine. Hey, um, thank you so much. Uh, you know, the fact that you have all these police unions weighing in is really telling because it doesn't impact their ability to contribute and support their preferred candidate. It just limits prosecutors from investigating them if they've taken money from them. So what they're saying is that they want prosecutors who they give money to to be the ones who investigate them when they commit misconduct. You know, as a licensed attorney, if I commit a violation of the rules of professional conduct, I can't have a state bar investigator or prosecutor who I have a financial relationship with review or decide whether or not I committed misconduct. That would be very improper. And yet somehow that is appropriate for elected prosecutors who are members of the state bar. Um, you know, just look at how hard these, these police associations are trying to ensure that these are the individuals that investigate them and not somebody without a conflict of interest. I think that that speaks to just how grave and serious of a problem this is. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have two more people who would like to give public comment. We're gonna have to cut it off. We still have Cheryl and Steve Bossy, and then we'll have to cut it off because we have the rest of the agenda to address. Cheryl, you have one minute and you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll have to move on to Steve Bossy. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Cheryl Morris, and I'm calling you today on behalf of the Los Angeles Port Police Association. And I'm calling to express my organization's strong opposition uh, mm -hmm. to the agenda item D2, the proposal that will bar law enforcement unions from contributing to candidates for district attorney. The request before the committee today is an overt attempt to silence the voice of law enforcement and it's discriminatory against our profession. Uh, the, the request is clear violation of our First Amendment rights and is designed to limit and undermine the author's opponents and amplify the voices of supporters. There are already rules and systems in place to address any legitimate conflicts of interest that might arise between prosecutors, police unions, rules that DAs are already required to follow. If you take that rationale of this short-sighted proposal to its logical oh. conclusion, all contribution endorsement to any attorney who runs for elected office should be prohibited. Yes. I urge you to reject. Your time is up. Sorry. Okay. I urge you to reject this incredibly biased request to silence union voices. Thank you for your time. Uh, next, we have Steve Bossy. Hello. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Steve Bassey, and I'm calling today on behalf of the Merced County Law Enforcement Sergeants Association. Um, Clearly this request is a clear violation of our First Amendment rights and is designed to limit and undermine the author's opponents and amplify the voices of their supporters. Um, it is 
inherently biased and unethical uh, to bar the participation of police unions while allowing special interest groups to continue contributing to and funding district attorney's elections. Um, I know the past speakers have said that this is not a violation of a First Amendment right, but it does uh, restrict us in what our capabilities are. I urge you to re reject this incredibly biased request to silence the union voices representing the men and women in California's law enforcement community do, that do a fine job. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm sorry, do we want to keep going on with public comment or should we cut it off because we need to get to the rest of our agenda, as I said? Mimi, how, how many more folks can you tell uh, um, are, are waiting to give public comment? Um, we have two. Well, David Carr had raised his hand, but then lowered it. I don't know if he'd still like to give public comment. Oh, he does. Should we do David and we have Sheila? And then I think we need to move on with the, ag uh, with the agenda after that. Okay, let's proceed with those two, and then I can um, then I can say okay. something. Okay, David, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm briefly commenting on the proposed changes to Rule 1.15, and uh, I urge the committee to take a very skeptical approach to these proposed changes, especially with respect to the rules that were with, with the proposed change that would impose an artificial 60 day deadline uh, to be enforced via a conclusive presumption uh, as far as the distribution of funds from trust. Uh, these, these rule changes are not clearly supported by any empirical uh, research or any findings from the, the State Bar's Discipline Audit Committee. Uh, they seem to be based solely on the activities of one particular lawyer. I don't know of another series of rule changes based on a single lawyer's misbehavior. Uh, but uh, I, these are gonna make it extremely difficult for lawyers to compromise statutory and contractual liens and, and complicate the lives of thousands of lawyers for no clear Good. reason. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and lastly, we have uh, Sheila. Oh, we lost Sheila. There we go. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I'm calling in support of this. It's absolutely critical that we um, deliberately disentangle law enforcement from district attorneys. We know that law enforcement in this country has way too many rights and is has they have additional, with those additional rights should come additional responsibilities and additional accountability, right? We see after the death of George Floyd and we've seen after the death of, I live in LA County, under Jackie Lacey's tenure, almost 700 people were murdered by the police and she didn't do anything. And that's because she took millions of dollars from her from them over the course of her career. We have to stop and think about what this is doing to communities of color, what this is doing to black communities and what this is doing to poor and, my, uh, and marginalized Ten seconds communities. Remaining. We have to make sure that we pass this and that we make sure that we do something different because history is looking at us and it is time to do something different. We are seeing Your a movement in this country to make sure that law enforcement is held accountable and you have to do your part. Okay, I'm sorry, I had to cut her off. She went over the time. Um, I think we can move on with the rest of the agenda. Okay, let me just um, um, thank those who gave public comment. Um, if, for those who um, were unable to give uh, public comment at our meeting today, I just wanna note that we do receive um, written comments from the public and we um, are, welcome you to provide us with written comments if you, if you have particularly something um, new or different to say than what we've um, heard from the commenters today. And also for those uh, who commented or wanted to comment, um, just for your benefit, I wanna make sure that you know that um, we have a very tight schedule today with a number of items that we um, must get to today. And uh, the committee will be um, certainly digesting the comments that we received today, but we will not be taking up 
the comp campaign contribution issue um, in the remainder of our meeting today. So I, I offer that for um, those who might have um, wanted to uh, stay on and hear um, any, any aspect of that discussion. Um, it's not um, going to be discussed at today's meeting. So Mimi, um, should we move to the, uh, the rest of the administrative report? Yes, um, I believe Randy has a staff report. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. I have only two items to present for the staff report. Uh, first, I have an update on the Bagley Keene open meeting requirements that were noted by Andrew at the December meeting. At the December meeting, Andrew alerted the committee that the special accommodations to Bagley Keene Act were expiring at the end of this month. Um, the good news that I have is that on January 5th, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom signed an executive order to extend the sunset of AB 361, which the governor previously signed to enable the public agencies to meet remotely during the COVID-19 emergency restrictions on in-person gatherings. Under the January 5th order, state bodies are permitted to continue holding meetings uh, via teleconference through March 31st under the existing more flexible rules. And so uh, what that means specifically for COPRAC is that for our February meeting, we are still under the status quo, but for meetings after March 31st, that's when Andrew's good uh, alert uh, kicks in, in terms of the changes that we might have to make with regard to how our meetings are noticed and the accessibility of the public uh, to our meetings. The second item I want to mention is that I am pleased to introduce my colleague, Katyun Hamaki, who is serving now as an acting staff attorney in the Office of Professional Competence. Uh, she is assigned to assist COPRAC until Andrew's position can be filled. Katyun is a Bay Area native and a graduate of UC Hastings. She has a wide array of legal experience, including litigation, employment, special education, and governance services for an education law firm in Oakland, and full service uh, eviction, eviction defense activities for the San Francisco Bar Association's Homeless Advocacy Project. In the Office of Professional Competence, she has handled ethics hotline inquiries and lawyer referral service research and investigations. She has also assisted with discovery and state bar litigation. COPRAC members are free to contact Katyun for any COPRAC matter that would have been previously sent to Andrew. And Katyun will closely coordinate with Mimi and me to make sure that COPRAC continues to receive strong attorney support until Andrew's vacant position can be filled. Um, please join me in welcoming Katyun to COPRAC. That's all I have for the staff report. Thanks, Randy, and, and welcome, Kat Katyun. We're, we're very uh, excited to have you here uh, and look forward to working with you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you. So up next, Mimi, do we need to approve the um, minutes from our prior meeting next? Yes. Or do you have something else on the agenda? Nope. Um, I will need a motion to approve the minutes from the December 3rd, 2021 action summary. Make so, the motion. You're making the motion? Yes. OK, can I get a second, please? I second. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Justin? Yes. Ken Bacon? Yes. Sarah Banola? Yes. Elizabeth Bradley? Cassidy Chivers? Toby Ann Linder? Yes. Brendan Kruger? Yes. Joel Mark? Yes. Eleanor Mercado? Bill Munoz? Yes. Kyla Rowe, Hunter Starr. Yes. Thank you, the motion carries. Mimi, it looks like there are some of our members that are on the um, other list. I see Cassidy on there and maybe Elizabeth that need to be moved over. Uh, I see, okay, promote to panelists, one second. And oh, I don't see Elizabeth, hold on. Yeah, I just saw her and she, maybe it's a different person. 
Um, hold on one second. I don't see Elizabeth on my list. Am I missing it? I don't. I don't see it now either. So I don't okay. know. If I had to call back in or something. I don't know. Maybe it was a different person. Okay. Um, Cassidy, are you with us? I am, but my video doesn't seem to be working. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's weird. Let me see. I'll just work on it. Keep and going. Do you want to vote on the action summary? I apologize. Yeah, I said yes, but okay. I couldn't tell if you could hear me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Oh, I see Elizabeth, but I don't know if it's Elizabeth. Elizabeth, is this Elizabeth Bradley? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I will uh, add you to the yeah, panel. Yeah, I'm having a, a hard time. I'm I'm not seeing seeing. Oh, now I just okay, got it. Now I have all my controls. I I couldn't figure out how to speak earlier. And for the action summary, are you voting in a to approve it as well? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, we're good. Okay, great. So um, let's move to our next item, which is the draft letter regarding the proposed um, paraprofessional rules of conduct. Um, you know, I, I want to thank the um, members of the committee who contributed to this letter. Um, We've also, I think, made a pass through this to try to make the style and tone a little more consistent. But as you um, probably gathered from reviewing it, it's still uh, very much a draft. Um, I, I took a pass through it and have some thoughts on how we can make edits. But really, um, in addition to any, any additional comments, um, those who assisted putting the draft letter together have it would be um, instrumentally helpful to hear from those who haven't yet provided feedback on um, our comments to these proposed rules to, to get your feedback so that we can incorporate it in the final letter, which um, to my understanding, um, we are endeavoring to submit um, to the paraprofessional working group prior to our next meeting. So it's really uh, imperative that we um, can I get as much feedback as possible from the committee in light of the deadline to, start to, to submit our public comment. Um, so with that, I'd like to open the floor to, um, to your feedback. And you know, frankly, it can be as simple as you, you saw a typo, but, more, but obviously more, um, more substantive comments um, or additional uh, thoughts than what we have already um, provided in this letter regarding the those rules would be very much welcome. So um, with that, I'll, I'll open the floor. Anyone? Okay, well, why don't I start with a few thoughts? Um, I think that the, the letter itself is <clears throat> somewhat lengthy and there are aspects of it that are duplicative where we kind of make the same point. So I'm thinking to shorten this, we can refer back to prior comments. So when we talk about, you know, the, um, the language about the prospective client's preferred language, and we kind of give our piece about why that might be ambiguous, which is a somewhat long paragraph or two. We don't. We can refer back to our original observation when we make that same observation in sub subsequent rules. And I think that that type of re reference back or incorporation by reference prior comments is going to help um, synthesize our comments and make this a little bit more. Um, readable, um, you know, but, but that's more of an organizational issue. Um, I'd be more interested if anyone has any substantive comments, including any um, 
agreements or really disagreements or enhancements that, that folks think we need to make to some of our comments on these rules. <clears throat> Nothing? Okay, well, um, I wanna come back to this then later. Maybe um, folks will have a chance to um, look at it uh, at a break or while we're, we're going through other agenda items because I'd really like to get some, um, some comments um, if, if folks need a little more time to look at this um, so that we can get this in shape to submit before the public comment deadline. So why don't we move to the next um, item for discussion, um, which is the uh, symposium topics. And I, Mimi, I, I don't know if you have the, um, the document that you circulated, the proposed symposium topics. Maybe we can put that up just to refresh everyone where we were in that discussion. Yes, I'm bringing it up right now. Okay, so um, the last meeting we discussed some ideas for proposed symposium topics. And we have, as you can see here, seven or eight um, topics. Um, we received uh, an additional thought from um, I think Joel, Ken, and Brandon about um, a uh, topic related to billing and liens. Maybe if, if um, Joel, Ken, or Brandon, if I can put one of you on the spot to maybe just give the committee uh, you know, the gist of what you were thinking about with respect to that topic. And then we can see if anyone has any thoughts about it. Yeah, um, the, the gist is summarized in um, my email, which was attached to that agenda item on proposed symposium topics. Um, and it really is just to basically hot, hot ethical topics in billing and uh, liens could be included as well. Uh, and the possible written materials have been suggested also that we could add, which is an outline that I had used for a presentation Oh, perhaps a dozen times at the state bar convention, um, which is uh, available for everybody to take a look at. But it's just that um, there is a general feeling that we haven't really touched on billing issues and billing issues still are one of the um, major concerns of complaints uh, against attorneys. They're not all ethical complaints. Some of them are just saying it was too much, but uh, at least it would give us a chance to cover that issue uh, uh, with the symposium and um, perhaps get some uh, new perspectives on that issue as well. So that's what we proposed and um, gave it some consideration. Thanks, thanks, Joel. Um, so, um, so what do, what do folks think is about this proposed topic? Um, at least from my perspective, given our charge related to, you know, mandatory, mandatory fee arbitration, advisory opinions and the like, and sorry if you can hear my screaming children right now, but, um, it, it does seem like it's apropos of what, um, is now part of our charge and, um, would be, a, a an appropriate, um, and, and timely topic for, for the symposium. What, what do others think? I agree with you, Justin. I, I think it'd be a, a great topic for the upcoming symposium. And I thought, I don't have it in front of me now, but I thought it was also perhaps something that some of the prior participants had inquired about. Yeah, I'm in favor. Right. 
I'm in favor of it as well. I think it would be an interesting topic and to incorporate fee arbitration into that discussion would be, like you said, Justin, important because of, because of our expanded charter. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, assuming this topic gets picked, um, you know, logistically, we'll have to think about how we would um, kind of staff that panel because uh, we'll want to, you know, we'll want to make sure that we uh, incorporate um, non-members of COPRAC uh, on on the panel. So most likely, we we would need to split up. Um, Joel, Ken, and Brandon, as much as I'm sure it would be fun to do all together. Um, practically, we might we might need um, one or more of you on, on other panels and or um, make room for non co members, but that's that's more of a logistical issue. I just wanted to flag that. I, I, would, I would love to see the three of you on this panel, but I think we'll, we'll probably have to make some choices about what makes most sense logistically. Um, for, for the um, compo composition of the panel as we move along. Um, do any, anyone have uh, different feelings about the billing lean um, type of symposium topic or can we um, move on and talk about other topics? Okay, so um, what I was thinking we could do is, is um, see if anyone else had additional topics for consideration above and beyond what we already have here in our possible topics. And hopefully we can um, today reduce these possible topics to about five. And then we, you know, uh, Mimi can correct me if I, if I have the procedure and timing wrong, but we'll need to confirm who is gonna moderate um, this, the symposium topics. I don't know that we necessarily do that at today's meeting. Um, no, however, we, my thought, oh, sorry? I think what we, we, we would do is uh, we would just um, pick the four topics that we'd like and we give, I think, I believe our third years, um, you know, first the option of moderating one of the panels. And um, if there's nobody who would like to moderate, then we would open it up to second years possibly. But first we just need to lock down the topics and then we'll, I'll send out some kind of like um, poll basically and you would rank which ones you would like to be on and we would just, um, we would uh, assign it that way. Okay. And, you know, um, just briefly chatting offline um, with, with Sarah and Dina, I think um, if we reduce it to five today, um, given that we don't know who the moderators are going to be, and, and most likely we would um, need to open up the um, moderator uh, opportunity to um, second year uh, on the on the committee because um, Sarah will most likely be on the leadership panel. Um, that if we reduce the topics here to five today, and just leave open a little flexibility um, in case somebody who doesn't know yet that they might be moderating um, has, has some flexibility to choose between two. I'm fine with that, I think we're, we're fine with that, but obviously we have more than five here. Um, and so we need, to, we need to cut back here so that we can um, make some decisions for our April symposium. So um, at least from my perspective, the, the leadership panel is, is kind of tried and true and that, that would, um, I think be one of the four panels. Um, the, um, the call it bill, billing related um, topic seems like it could be one of the, the four or five um, panels for the reasons that we've already discussed. And so uh, I think it's a matter of which of these other topics do we want to consider and which are we comfortable saying, you know, let's let's put this off for another for another year? Um, and so I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts, with, so that we can cut this list down and finalize our you know, 
call it five topics for now um, and, and have this you know, winnowed down so that we're ready to um, do what we need to do to get for, for the April symposium. So what are, what are people's thoughts about yay or nay on these other topics? Uh, Brent, uh, Justin, could I ask a question? What was the concept of the entry to practice of law topic? Uh, you know, I don't remember off the top of my head. I, I can't remember if that was Hunter had um, proposed that or someone else. Um, am I am I remembering correctly, Hunter? I I don't remember if I did. I think I did discuss the likelihood of a topic regarding newer attorneys so that we could get some of the newer attorneys to be getting to the symposium and being a little bit more ethics minded. I may have I may have recommended that. And this would be uh, essentially just an intro to, you know, considerations, uh, ways you can set up your practice so that you can avoid some of the major pitfalls. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting is that, topic. Is that combined, I'm oh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm unclear if you're trying to combine like how do people become lawyers, like the entry to practice of law in terms of like the admission process and and moral character and sort of navigating those or like opening your own practice is like probably a separate topic that most people that are becoming lawyers may or may not be doing that. It, those seem sort of not necessarily related, but I don't, I'm trying to figure out what. No, that does bring that does bring back uh, my memory of how I originally broached it, which was the uh, entry to practice of law. I know that the uh, the the bar exam and and whether to have it at all and when we have it, how hard should it be has become a hot topic among certain circles lately. Um, so I think that 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 was actually what it was. My focus generally is on getting young lawyers involved in ethics, though, um, in, in any event. So Hunter, do you have, um, sorry to put you on the spot, you can tell me you don't have any thoughts on this, but how we would tie those um, subjects uh, to, um, you know, legal ethics, professional conduct um, for purposes of this topic, because I, I think that, that, that would be a hook that we would need to use both because um, you know, the nature <laughs> of the uh, symposium, but I think also practically speaking, is, and historically, the uh, attendees at our symposium are um, some folks who just need CLE, which is great. And, and that's, you know, we want those um, attorneys to come. And, but but a, a good chunk of the attendees are, um, you know, former COPRAC members and folks in the sort of um, professional ethics community. And so they'll be looking for that, that hook as well. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on what that, the ethics hook might be to this topic? Not particularly. I, okay. I know that th throughout time, the, uh, the bar exam has included more and more of uh, the uh, professional ethics uh, requirements what would the practice of law look like if, if that was not tested and if that was not uh, emphasized? But I, I really don't. I really don't. Yeah. Justin? I, uh, okay, just real quickly. Um, every other year when I was up in Ventura County, I put on a program for new lawyers about ethics. And we just go through the whole ethics things. But I'm not sure that's a symposium issue because well, Lord knows they need it, but um, it just, I'm not sure it's a symposium issue. That's all. I would I, like I, to point out that they do have a 10 hour requirement, new attorney MCLE program that they're required to take uh, via an e-learning platform now. So they are getting that introduction to ethics, client confidentiality, communication, um, client trust accounting, that that's the required to take within the first year of being an attorney. So maybe um, if we're trying to give them, um, they might be already getting that education that they're required to take. And Justin, I'm not, I'm not married to this topic by any, by any means. Yeah, I totally understand. I'm, what I'm, what I'm kind of drilling down on is um, 
to, to Joel and Mimi's points is, at least at present, it's um, kind of proposed as a more of a general or generic ethics panel, and it doesn't quite have that, you know, specific narrow ethics hook that, that you know, we might be looking for, um, you know, both to capture the interest of the audience, but also, you know, given that we're, we're probably not looking to give um, sort of a generalized um, presentation to new lawyers, because most likely um, we're going to have a lot of senior um, lawyers in, in, the, in the audience. So, it, you know, unless there is that more specific or focused ethics hook that we could tie to this subject, I, I'm inclined to defer it until, um, you know, for further discussion, you know, for another symposium. Uh, I unless I unless I someone has some, some additional thoughts on how we might refine the, the subject. I'd agree with your take on it, Justin. Okay. I mean, I like the idea of trying to get a younger crowd there and trying to maybe have like a mixed crowd where like not everything in the symposium is like geared towards these people that have been former Cobra actors or whatever, like this, you know, having it more like we have some, some topics at the symposium that are going to appeal to different people. And then you bring people in and maybe they don't pay attention to one of the topics. I don't know. But like, I like that idea. Generally, I think, you know, issues that young lawyers face can include like duties under, you know, as a, um, a subordinate attorney and how to navigate that role, you know, bringing in some of the impairment issues. I mean, there are certain issues that people have younger attorneys that maybe you, we could carve out certain issues that would be relevant to them. I, I, you know, so I can see some, but it would, it definitely wouldn't be, um, it would probably include categories and topics of things that more experienced legal ethicists would already be familiar with potentially, right? So there's that risk there. So I just bring that up. I mean, I do think there's a, there is a possibility there. Um, I also thought I was really interested. I remember last time and someone talking about the implicit bias, elimination of bias topic and had some good thoughts. And maybe it was Mimi, I can't remember about just an approach to that panel. And I, I was hoping whoever talked about that last time could, could provide more information about that. I thought that sounded like that could be a potentially interesting topic. I, I also wanted to hear more about that topic, but I had a question about what the thoughts were about discipline and how to avoid it and whether or not, depending on the approach, um, it might be framed in a way that would be helpful to new practitioners. Um, so before we go to the discipline and how to avoid it, Toby, uh, if we could just um, finish our discussion on this entry to the practice of law, and then and let's turn to that topic next, because I think it's also one that has a lot of potential, but I think might, you know, we'd have to refine it. Um, find well, ways I'm to wondering refine it. if there was a way to refine it that would help address the entry to the practice of law issue. That was my question. <laughs> Okay. I see. I see. Um, so, yeah, because I think new new lawyers um, unfamiliar with the rules and practice might <laughs> theoretically find themselves more susceptible to discipline if they do something that is um, problematic. And and so I, I can see how that would be a way to tie um, the, or marry the two topics. I just don't know specifically um, what those subjects would be. Um, although Dina raises, you know, a couple of good examples, um, like, um, you know, the, role, the, the obligations of a subordinate attorney and imp impairment issues. Um, you know, we, we have, we had, I don't know if it made it into the final opinion or, or was a, um, just a scenario we considered when a, um, you know, a young lawyer um, was working with a senior lawyer who was impaired and the uh, ethical obligations on that um, subordinate attorney. I mean, those are interesting and sometimes challenging um, ethical and professional issues. Um, and, and if the subordinate lawyer doesn't choose wisely, it could subject them to discipline. And so, um, you know, 
I, I, I see your point, Toby, um, about how these could be married um, together. Um, what do others think? I had a question on the in-house counsel subject. If you want to. Um, so I, I'd, I'd rather not jump around if, uh, if we can avoid it. Um, okay. Because uh, at least from my perspective, the, the two in my mind that um, I'm, I'm on the fence about is the entry to practice law and discipline and how to avoid it because at least in our prior discussion, they, we, we discussed it at kind of a high level. And I think that if these were to, to work, I think we would need to put some more meat on the bones, be a little more specific about the ethical issues um, that we would wanna discuss. And it sounds like um, there's you know, some thoughts that we could marry these two um, subjects potentially and make it, um, I think, both relevant to new attorneys, but also, um, more senior lawyers to the extent that we're talking about things like a subordinate lawyer's role, particularly relative to um, senior lawyers um, when, when issues come up, when, such as with impairment and, and things along those lines. But, um, you know, candidly, I'm, I'm not sure if we're quite at the point yet where we've refined either of those topics or married them in a way where we really have a cogent symposium topic yet. So I'd be curious to hear other other thoughts if, if there's a way to move these two forward separately or together um, into something that we might want to um, keep on our, our, on our topic uh, list. And then uh, once we've exhausted that discussion, let's, let's move to in-house counsel. Yeah, to, to some extent, uh, for the discipline and how to avoid it, it also depends on um, who might be interested in moderating that type of panel. I do agree with Toby that it is a good way to tie in um, newer lawyers and kind of it could, the focus could be perhaps on, you know, top five um, areas of discipline um, and focus on those issues or, or something to that effect. Um, it could also address the procedure itself that New York attorneys might be unaware of. So I, I, I do think it's a good way to tie in the newer attorney issue that Hunter suggested initially. Um, but yeah, so I, I just, I know previously, uh, David Carr, who spoke earlier at the public comment, he did a lot of state bar defense, but I don't know if there's, there are others here who would be interested in, in moderating that, that type of panel. I think that would be a, an issue uh, to decide whether we want to pursue it as well. That, that's a really good point, Sarah. I, I have some recollection over the years when, when the um, discipline related topics have been discussed that there's been concern that um, you know, as a practical matter, we, we would not be able to get someone from you know, OTC to participate on the panel. Um, uh, and it might be a challenge in terms of um, finding panelists um, to talk about areas of discipline, and the procedures um, and things like that. And so we'd have to find a way around that, um, yeah, which has always been a, a topic of debate how to do that and so I think we've at least since I've been on the committee we've sort of steered clear of a um, discipline specific topic but you know in the way that we're discussing it now I think it seems broader than just um, you know the the procedures for discipline um, and so I think that we would have to kind of keep that in mind um, as we think through um, these these topics separate or together. Yeah, um, that's a good point in terms of the broader interest. I, I know for um, the April organization, they typically have the discipline um, panel on the on the final day and it doesn't 
you know, it draws more of the crowd who, who focuses in that area of practice. And so, but I, if we do tie to the newer attorney issue, um, it could draw a broader crowd. Um, I, so I, I defer to others. I just I think it could be useful. Justin, a quick question. Um, when we were uh, doing this, the uh, mandatory fee arbitration committee on every other agenda, it seemed there was always a, a place where we'd say a certain meeting is coming up, uh, like the solo and small firm symposium and things like that. And did we want to send speakers to it? And we always did. In my year plus now back on COPRAC, I haven't heard us talk about any other of those opportunities. And some of these topics we're talking about, we really should be getting out there to those other organizations if we want to bring more people in, younger attorneys, um, those, um, what do they call them? Uh, ben, uh, whatever, introduction to the bar things that a lot of local bar associations put on and things like that. And I just haven't heard us be real active that way. So I'm wondering if maybe we shouldn't open up and put some of these topics on some of those additional opportunities. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make. Um, I think prior to the pandemic, we received many more requests from um, local bar associations for um, volunteers from the committee to go and speak to them on, on various subjects or a subject of our choice. And quite frankly, I have not seen those emails except for one or two um, since March of 2020. Um, so hopefully when the world normalizes, those types of opportunities will come up more. Um, and, um, you know, quite frankly, I don't think we've been um, proactive in terms of going out to local um, bar associations and saying, hey, do you want somebody from GoPrac to speak? And, and maybe as a practical matter, we haven't done that because many of the um, bar associations have their own ethics committees and, and have their own speakers. But, but certainly from time to time, and, and I think more so before the pandemic, we would get those types of requests and go out in the community. And we also used to have a, um, you know, an, an, an MCLE that we would put together in the newsletter and that, that has kind of also gone by the wayside. So I think that's um, a subject that we should um, maybe put on the agenda to discuss uh, at some point about how we can um, kind of have a stronger presence in the in the community, especially given the challenges that we have, um, you know, largely being remote and, and making sure that we're as relevant as we can be um, in, in getting um, ethics messaging out to those who might need it, particularly in smaller um, counties or, or, or with bar associations that don't have their own ethics committee. Yeah, um, uh, Justin, it used to be on our agenda, the outreach subcommittee. I took it off because we haven't discussed it in many, many months. <laughs> But yes. what we did do previously was send out a letter, a group of letters, usually dependent, um, but mostly to smaller bar associations, um, like ethnic bar associations, more rural bar associations. And we would reach out to them and say, hey, if you would ever like us to come speak, well, we can do that. And so we used to do that, but then COVID happened. And so it's been a little bit since um, we've sent out those letters, but um, maybe we could revisit that. Um, we can get put together a list of um, um, organizations that we would like to ask them if they would like us to come and speak to them and we can revisit this maybe at a future meeting. I think that's great. I think that we should um, put this on um, as an agenda item Okay. for, for um, either the next meeting or the one that follows, depending on how much time we have. Justin, um, that's because, great. I mean, knowing that there's going to possibly be those opportunities for us to reach out to the people who might not be getting, but really need some additional topics like these, it'll make it easier for us today to winnow down what we're gonna do for the symposium. Okay. And in regards to the solo summit and annual meeting, we did do that in the past. I think the last time we did the solo summit made an appearance was probably 2017, maybe. Um, and so we would spend, we would send a panel um, from COPRAC. We would submit a, you know, a proposal like this is a topic we'd like to do, and we would submit it and we would send speakers. But since then, I don't think we've done it since 2007. 
2017 is my recollection. And I don't know, um, and then same thing goes with the annual meeting. The annual meeting was postponed due to COVID. So there was no opportunity to try to do that as well. Okay, that explains it. <laughs> um, good, so um, th thanks for that. I think that that's, um, those are good thoughts about how we can get um, broader outreach um, in the community besides just our symposium. So that's great. Um, Sarah, you, you mentioned April and that they have a discipline panel um, any concern that whatever discipline type of panel we might do is going to either overlap or duplicate with what April does, um, or are there issues that we would need to kind of try to avoid because they come up in, in the April panels? Because I know that that's one reason we, um, I raise it because that's one reason we moved away from the leadership panel in discussing recent case law and instead focusing on um, our COPRAC opinions because we understand that the you know, COA is now doing a sort of recent trends and cases type of panel. So we've tried to avoid duplication with what other um, professional associations are doing. Yeah, so I, I don't know if anyone else could speak on that. I, I, t I usually don't attend that <laughs> discipline panel on the final day because I'm usually in the past, I would I would be traveling back. I haven't participated in the most recent um, April annual meetings, um, so I don't know if others have and can comment on that. But it might. It's, I mean, it's like a. Um, I haven't either because I don't do that work. But I know Kendra has. But it's like a. It's kind of like a brand. It's like a round table brown bag. It's basically like people talk about recent issues, dif discipline defense attorneys that they're facing with state bars in their various jurisdictions. So it's not geared towards like issues of helping you know, an attorney avoid discipline. It's more like attorneys that deal in discipline defense matters talking about, you know, some recent trends or issues or challenges or that come up for them and how they've navigated them and sort of like a, you know, a sharing experience. And so there's not usually like some particular topic or anything like that. Okay, got it, that's helpful. Well, recently on the, the listserv, the hot topic has been um, discipline prosecution abuses and, the whole California thing, the reorganization, and uh, they're on that. I don't know if it's on this uh, this coming up meeting in Seattle in February, but um, they are all over that. Okay, so um, any other any other comments about the discipline and how to avoid it and the um, new attorney? topics and potentially marrying them? I, I think that, you know, I liked the point that sort of came out of it uh, about maybe trying to marry them with young lawyers and discipline issues, but trying to take it to maybe more of a public outreach thing in a way that we could target to like, I don't know, state other bar associations or something where somebody could do that as a panel or something somewhere else. Because it, it just is a question about whether or not we're, you know, what audience we're reaching to and whether that would be. Um, and I do agree with Sarah's point about we would really want to have a person that is experienced in these areas of discipline if we were going to do a topic on that as a moderator or something I think that would be very helpful to have that I'm not sure that there's someone on our panel right now that has that um, background but I just would leave it at, at that so maybe we combine those but sort of put them over for either next year or for another outreach idea that's I would that would just be a suggestion okay um, well, let's let's talk through some of these other topics and then see where we uh, land. But uh, you know that, I, Dina, I, I kind of am inclined to agree. But let's go through these. I think Ken, you mentioned the in-house counsel issues uh, and and had some thoughts there. Yeah, I was just wondering. I don't remember what the scope when that was was proposed, whether we're talking like corporate counsel or that sort of thing. Um, but one of the issues that you know I deal with from time to time is not so much variation on in-house, but in-firm uh, counsel and attorney-client privilege issues for in, you know, risk management and in-firm ethics counsel. Um, I thought that would be an interesting topic for this group of people. What what specifically are you thinking of? I mean, what comes to mind for me is like, you know, whether the attorney client privilege applies. And I had a fun 
dispute with with someone that you all know well uh, in I think it was the reporter when I was a younger lawyer and he didn't he didn't like my view and he wrote a very mean response it turned out that I was correct and he was not but uh, and the privilege applies um, so I I've unfortunately for better or worse become familiar with that topic um, which at least from, from my perspective seems pretty um, settled in California about you know whether the attorney-client privilege applies or when it applies. Um, although there can be nuances depending on some factors, um, and who's doing the talking to the in-house lawyer and whether they're billing time to the client and things like that. But yeah, that, I was. Is that what you're thinking of, or are you thinking of something else? In 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 firm, like in law firms, if you have an in-house risk management attorney and you know attorney-client privilege and you know in that context. I'm not sure that's yep. quite as set. Is that, I'm not sure how settled that really is. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, it's okay. the, uh, what is it? The Wildman Palmer, Edwards Wildman Palmer case. Yeah, that's, that's the case. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, I, I, I may be incorrect, but Cassidy, weren't you recently an in-house lawyer for a firm? Oh, I got that wrong. I think she is now. Oh, okay. Well, that, I'd like to get that perspective. I, I was, I proposed this topic and just to be clear, I mean, not that we couldn't expand it to whatever we wanted. I was proposing it as, you know, in-house counsel for companies, people that take on, the, not lawyers that are in their law firms being a general counsel or things like that. It would be people that actually are working for non-law firms, but are in an in-house legal department and, uh, and, and some of those issues that come up in that context where they're wearing like multiple hats and like, is our, am I talking about business issues? Am I giving legal advice or business advice? And, you know, um, you know, who's the lawyer's client? Like some of those, I mean, not that there's some basic stuff. We did that outline because we are considering it for a COBRAC opinion and it kind of has been, you know, um, sidelined, but that touched on about 10 different issues related to like up the ladder reporting, communications with third parties and, and some of those issues. Um, and, you know, resignation withdrawals, you know, is also an issue. And we sort of briefly have touched upon that and in, in that improper uh, contract provision opinion. But so that was what I think when I proposed it was what we were referring to. Now, refining it to specific topics would probably be more helpful than an overview. But that's just just for the context of that topic. Yeah. And this is Cassidy. Sorry, I've, I've been having connection issues. Um, so I'm sorry. I don't think you can see me. But um, yeah, that I agree with Dina. I think I I I am I am in favor of of this topic um, with the um, general counsel of, of companies and that sort of thing with the conflicts issues with um, um, you know when they're dealing with mergers and acquisitions and that sort of thing. There's just not a lot of guidance out there um, for both us as ethics lawyers in advising these clients and for them. Um, in you know how to operate within the in-house environment, and I and I find in in in, in advising these clients that they kind of don't see the ethics rules applying to them because they don't see how it works in in it. It just sometimes they don't just fit. They they don't fit very neatly. So I think it would be a good topic to provide that type of guidance. Although I don't know you know how many in-house lawyers would actually attend the symposium, and maybe there's a you guys have a record of you know who attends, um, but I, I I think it would be really helpful. I wish there was an ethics opinion on on um, this area. Yeah, okay. and Cass Cassidy, just so you know, we are that is in progress. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's fallen. Uh, we, we will, it's only an outline form right now. Um, but if you're interested um, in serving in that subcommittee, um, yeah. let me know. That would be great. Yeah, and, and I I, I just wanted to say. Um, I think this is a really useful topic beyond j just the, uh, the the audience of in-house counsel people. I actually have potential clients who have potential claims against their company's in-house counsel and the the intricacies and specific issues raised are really complex and not all that fleshed out. Um, and I, I think, you know, I'd be really interested to learn from this panel, so. Yeah, I mean, just from prior presentations, uh, I have in my own mind a couple uh, conflict-related cases 
that involve in-house counsel that and they just have some very colorful facts and i'm sure there are many other cases um and i won't, I won't i'll spare you the the details but um i think that there's a lot of this could garner a lot of um, interest and i think the topic is one that could be presented in a way that um that is flavorful and would would um, capture the audience's attention um so i i think that you know that we, Dina, you've given us a, a number of different sort of sub subtopics within this that a panel could choose from um, and kind of just highlight what they think would be most um, interesting and um, capture our audience's attention. And, you know, while it would be wonderful to get in-house counsel to attend a co-practice symposium, and, and maybe we, we find some ways to, to try to do that, I agree with you, Brandon, that this is this is a, a topic that um, should have appeal beyond just in-house counsel, including those who um, re potentially represent in-house counsel or those who um, represent claimants against in-house counsel and the like. So I think it, it has a wide, um, widespread appeal, um, even though it, you know maybe on its face sounds sounds narrow. So, um, what, any any other thoughts about this uh, topic? No, I, I agree, and I support the idea for a panel. Um, I also think if we could get an, someone in house to be a panelist, that would be great and help promote um, the symposium and that panel, so we get more participants who are in house counsel at, at companies, and maybe there's a way Coprac can help promote it in that way too. Um, I, I think it would be a great topic because I, I think there, there really isn't a lot of guidance as Cassidy mentioned for in-house counsel. Yeah, that's I, a great thought. Oh. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that um, it's a great topic on its own, but also I see it as one of those topics that is a potential for bringing in some people who might not otherwise show up. And the other one I put in that category is of course the bias and uh, that sort of thing. But um, I think it's a great topic. Uh, I agree too. And um, particularly, I think is what's interesting, not just for the in-house counsel, but for lawyers that represent either in-house counsel or companies and they're supervised by in-house counsel are the really sometimes complicated and complex uh, conflicts issues. And I think the importance is gonna be how we market it and how we describe the content in the promotional materials for the symposium to make sure that we're, it doesn't sound like it's branded just to apply to people who are actually in-house. And one thing we might consider if we're looking outside of the committee for someone who has been or is in-house counsel, um, keeping it kind of branded for COPRAC, I do know Neil Wortlieb has served as in-house um, general counsel for one, if not two um, companies. So he might be a good person as a past chair um, with direct in-house counsel, general counsel um, experience. So that's kind of still COPRAC related person. Yeah, those are, those are good thoughts. Um, well, uh, any, any, anyone else want to chime in on in-house counsel issues? It sounds like this is this is one that's going to make our cut here. Just so you know, um, it was part of the feedback on suggested panel topics almost every year. Somebody always requests that a future topic be about in-house counsel. There you go. Um, yet another reason. So, um, Looks like to me, we have two more topics to, to talk about here. Um, we, we since we already touched on it a little bit, why don't we go there next? It's the, I'll call it the implicit bias um, panel, although it's probably much more than that. Um, I think at our prior meeting, we, we all agreed that this is an excellent um, subject, an important subject uh, at a high level. I don't know that we really got into the weeds uh, last time, and I'm not sure that we're in a position to get in the weeds today, but 
it is so broad of a subject and such a relevant subject uh, today that uh, you know if, if we can um, you know make it work as as I think many um, ethics panels have uh, around the country over the last five or six years um, that it's one that we should seriously consider and, and to Mimi's last point I, I would imagine that um, this type of subject comes up in, in comments, people requesting it, um, both because they're interested in the subject and they need the um, elimination of bias um, <laughs> credit, um, which we would um, want to make sure this was certified for. Um, but does anyone have any, any more specific thoughts about what we could do with this um, topic or the, the type of presenters we might consider? Um, for this topic to see if we can try to refine it a bit while we're all together. I, I've attended um, a, a panel recently on microaggressions and recognizing and responding to microaggressions. And I think that um, the, the speaker was excellent. Um, there, there were two speakers that were both excellent. And I, I think that might be a good um, incorporating microaggressions as part of that panel. Um, it was pretty, it was an interact, they tried to make an interactive type panel. And I, I always think those are, are good ones. Is there a way to sort of combine that with like a discussion of the civility rules that are being proposed? Or is that sort of a stretch? But I mean, just sort of, uh, I mean, this kind of dovetails, I mean, there's a lot of different avenues that this topic could take us, but treatment of other attorneys based on some of these, like, like microaggression is one way to, you know, I, I just thinking about sort of attorney behavior, not to totally devolve it into that, but whether there's a place to discuss the civility as part of that, just a thought. Yeah, I think, especially addressing the overlap between bias and civility, um, I think that would be useful. And that's part of, um, the civility task force um, recent report is, is talking about the educational proposed requirement should include um, the overlap between civility and bias. So I, I think there is a good way to weave in civility if, if possible to this panel, maybe not make it the focus, but just incorporate it to some extent. That, that makes good sense to me. And maybe Dina, if, if you have any just general background when, when you're talking about the new rules um, or guidelines about civility and professionals and you kind of know where that's at. And, and... Um, Sarah knows one... more than I do after Mimi talks. Yes, yeah, Sarah's oh. on that committee. And oh she yeah, that's more. right, that's right. So I just want you to know that the last time we did something regarding civility was in 2013. It was the six in stones may break your bones, but your own words and conduct might really hurt you. It had to do with the ethical issues that arise when lawyers cross the line from aggressive law lawyering to uncivil or unprofessional conduct, resulting in sanctions, contempt orders, reporting to the bar and more. Um, we think we had two trial judges who were on the panel at that time. But I mean, I'm not saying we had to do the same exact one, but we did something on civility and professionalism. Maybe sounds like a good idea if we could tie it to also microaggressions and um, implicit bias in some way. It was something that was um, done uh, about, you know, eight, eight years ago. No, that's good feedback. And I think, you know, uh, over the last decade, I think there's um, a heightened awareness, more um, publicity about things like unconscious bias and things along those lines that we could um, really um, reinforce and kind of um, deepen the discussion um, from whatever happened in 2013. And, and I think looking back to that and, and seeing where, you know, what, what angles we might want to take that are different or um, um, new. Um, would be helpful. So that's a good foundation for, uh, I think, what this panel might um, consider, you know, specifically discussing. Um, so we'll, we'll be sure to make sure that um, get some more intel on that 2013 panel. Um, I think somebody was going to say something uh, after Mimi. I didn't mean to cut, cut you off. Nope, I'm good. Okay.
Any anything else on the implicit bias panel? Other thoughts? Okay. Uh, so then, finally, we have cryptocurrency, um, which you know, in the last discussion in December, I think we all thought this would be an interesting topic. I've seen it done in the ethics context uh, four or five years ago, so I know that it can be done. Um, it's it's a topic that uh, you know, with Eleanor and, and Bill's. Good work. We're we're looking at as a potential opinion. So, um, which is kind of in the, the nation stages issue outline and, and so on in terms of where we are at. So it's something that's sort of already in the pipeline for Coprac, even if we were not going to include it in the symposium this year. Um, and I think it's you know it's frankly it's fair to say that we don't have a cryptocurrency expert on this. Um, <laughs> On this committee, um, in terms of thinking ahead about who would moderate this, so that that might be a, a knock on it at this point. And, and um, you know, it's one where whether it's in in a leadership panel in the future, talking about a perspective, uh, opinion, opinion, or an opinion we're working on, or just gaining more knowledge about cryptocurrency as we go through the um, the opinion drafting process that we've just started. I'm I'm just thinking out loud here. I wonder if. Um, this would be better suited for either another year when we know more about it internally as a committee. Um, but uh, by no means am I trying to persuade anyone that this should not be one of our top five. Um, but that's just kind of my gut reaction um, after we've gone through talking about the other um, the other topics. Um, so I'll be quiet now. What, what do other people think? And uh, I agree, with you, uh, Justin. I think. Uh, there are so many nuances to cryptocurrency in the, in the mind field that it presents um, you know, trust and all that good stuff that will somehow hopefully appear in our opinion and fit through the book with beyond the issue stage. Um, you know, if, if we did have, if we, unless we had some expert in cryptocurrency and how to do it, I would not. Best to, to get more information and be more familiar with it before having a symposium this year. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Bill. Other thoughts on, on cryptocurrency? Okay, yeah, I mean, you know, frankly, I think it would be. Of of the um, ones that we're considering, it would be the heaviest lift for the committee to kind of get up to speed on cryptocurrency to find people to somewhat um, uh, niche uh, practice. So finding finding panelists, um, you know, might might also present some some difficulties, especially uh, with people's uh, schedules being challenged by um, the pandemic. Um, so I, I just, uh, anyway, uh, I think it's an interesting one, but maybe one we want to defer um, at this point. Does anyone disagree with that or have different thoughts? Totally open to it. I agree, Justin. I think if we, you know, it may come up, we can do a 10 minutes on it in the leadership one, if it makes sense to do and say like, these are things we're looking into and, in you know, and talk like we did about one of the opinions last year that we were in progress on. So that's an option if we decide that we want to explore it a little bit, but not uh, not worth a an hour and 15 minute panel that we're really not maybe ready for at this point. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great idea. You know, just to whet the appetite of our audience, let them know what's what's coming in the pipeline. And that's kind of one of the purposes of the, the leadership panel is to um, let people know what we're up to. Um, to the to the discussion earlier, you know, that we haven't really been getting out to Local bar associations and things like that. It, you know, one of the, the mod reasons we modified the leadership panel, in addition to not wanting to duplicate what other asso professional associations do, is to kind of advertise a little bit about what Coprac is doing and what we've been up to. Um, so I think perhaps highlighting cryptocurrency, if, if we have time, um, in, in our ten to twelve minute segments that we have for various topics, um, it, it's a good one to think about. 
So um, right now, subject to any, anyone else's input, it looks like our top four is the what I'm calling the leadership panel, that first one, the billing panel, the in-house counsel panel, the, and the implicit bias panel. And we have just kind of as a maybe, because you know, again, I don't know who the moderators are going to be, or somebody might have the light bulb come off. I think we can at least keep it as a maybe the um, the entry in the practice of law discipline panel. And that would take us to five, knowing that we ultimately need to select four. So that I think puts us in a pretty good position in terms of next steps of selecting um, or, or moderators or obtaining volunteers to serve as moderators and then to try to determine what panelists would be. But um, let me pause there. Um, does anyone have any additional topics that they want to raise or discuss before we sort of solidify these as the potential top five? Does anyone have any thoughts or concerns, I should say, about these five? Anything else that we should be discussing right now before we kind of lock these in? Justin, it's not a new topic, but has there been any talk yet about whether we're going to be able to do it in person in April or any thought at all, or are we just going to wait and see? I believe we're going to hold it um, remotely again via Zoom. Okay. I, yeah, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I think that that makes sense. And um, if something were to change, I think we would have a discussion about it. But um, I really can't imagine that it would be in person, uh, unfortunately, with how things have gone. So, um, but, but, but that's good to, to at least kind of have in our minds that this is gonna be another, another remote um, symposium. And I thought that it really went, went well all things considered last year, and we, we had great turnout. And if we can continue that to up our turnout, um, you know, that that's certainly a goal. And, um, you know, we will, we should, we should all I think, try to make some good efforts to advertise this. Do you, do you have a sense, Mimi? Um, I think last year, because it was done remotely, that the symposium was free. Do you have, has there been any discussion at the bar about whether it would be free again, or whether there would be some kind of nominal charge? For people um, to attend. I'll let Randy speak to that. Randy, do you want to address that? Sure. The Office of Professional Confidence has gone through its annual budgeting process, and we have made a determination that we do need to charge um, a, a, an amount that will probably be much less than what has been charged historically for this event. Uh, when the event was held in person, uh, we had a number of costs to recoup in terms of uh, charges by the site that uh, was providing the location for the symposium, the fact that we provided lunch, reimbursement of travel and other expenses uh, for the uh, panel members. Uh, we don't have all of those expenses, but we do still have some things that require us to try to make the event as revenue neutral as possible. So we are thinking of charging something, maybe to the tune of $50, can't promise that that will be the exact cost, but it is still an incredible bargain for both the quality and the amount of CLA credit that the attendees will receive. Well, I absolutely agree that it's a great deal. Um, you know, but keep us posted on what the determination is. And um, obviously the, the lower it is, the more likely people will turn out and uh, you know, just leave it at that. Um, I have one quick question for Mimi, I think um, about, the elimination of bias, like that, that topic in general, is there some specific criteria that we need to be mindful of as we're as that topic is being fleshed out in terms of like to be able to qualify? Because I know one of the things we talked about is getting that CLE credit for that particular category, and how is that determination made? Um, uh, let me jump in on that. There okay. have been okay. some new things that have actually uh, taken effect uh, January first, twenty twenty two, that deal with the eligibility for obtaining credit for implicit bias. And um, some of it deal with the uh, issue of who should be the presenter and what are the, the more nuanced uh, uh, descriptions of, of the topics. And so uh, if this program goes forward, we will definitely uh, take a look at those requirements, particularly the new ones operative this year, 
and uh, guide the committee as it uh, picks its speakers, as well as design the, the actual topics to discuss because uh, the requirements are changing this year. That's uh, helpful. Okay, you thanks. want to look at them in advance. It's um, 6070.5 and rule of the state bar 3.601, but we will look at them for you. And I believe the last time we did do a course that did have um, implicit bias credit, I think it was the panel that Judge Wendy Chang was on. At that time, I don't think she was. I don't know if she was. No, it was judge. last year, Mimi. We did the um, impaired attorney, and we had someone from the state bar talking about attorney impairment, remember? Oh, no, previous to that. It was the oh. uh, prohibited discrimination and sexual harassment in the legal profession. That did qualify for um, elimination of bias uh, credit. And this was in 2018. And it was uh, Wendy Chang, Carol Buckner, and Joel Osmond who were on the panel. And I think what we did was it offered 1.25 hours of MCLE in recognition and elimination of bias. So that panel actually addressed rule 8.4.1, which was um, new at the time. So that's what that was another course that actually qualified for that um, type of credit. Okay. Yeah, I think looking at that sooner rather than later for us, um, Randall would be terrific so that um, as we kind of refine the topic and select the moderator and the panelists, uh, as, you, as you noted, will uh, hopefully be in good shape to ensure that we can get the, the implicit bias credit for the attendees. So um, appreciate, that's a good question, Dina. I appreciate the feedback um, about um, the new requirements. Okay, um, anything else with respect to the symposium topics that people wanna discuss? So just for clarification, um, we are going with all five topics for now until we find out who wants to moderate which panel? Yes. Or are we, have we narrowed it to four? I, I, in, unless, unless there's a, a strong view otherwise, Given the conversation today, uh, at least I'm comfortable having these five and um, and just leaving the door open in, in case there's a further uh, you know light bulb that goes off for someone that they'd rather do number four instead of number five or vice versa. Um, but if if uh, there's concern logistically, that's that's not a good idea. We need to cut it to four now, so be it. Um, but at least for me personally, I'm okay at this point leaving it by. Okay. And just so you know, um, I believe when it comes to, so the, of the fourth year members, which I believe Toby is the only one, not including leadership, will also um, Ken and Bacon, uh, Ken and Brandon will be next in line because they are third year. So they'll have for some which panels that they'd like to moderate. And then once we determine that, then I will talk to the second year to see if there's anybody who would like to volunteer to moderate one of the other panels. Makes sense, makes sense, thanks. All right, well, uh, why don't we move to briefly discuss uh, new opinion topics and, and issue outlines and just check in on those. Uh, I think that there are only one or two Pulling up the materials here, one or two uh, issue outlines um, that we received for today's meeting, and we don't need to go through either of them in, in significant detail. I just wanted to give committee members an, an opportunity to, to give some high-level thoughts um, at this point, if they have any, on the flat fee outline or the uh, 21001 uh, issue outline, and then also probably Hunter get some feedback from you on, on whether you think it's worth pursuing that one further or not based on your further analysis. And then um, and then maybe we can have a general discussion about the issue outlines and, uh, that um, we've considered um, but have not yet been um, circulated and see where those are at. So uh, I think why don't we start with the um, issue outline regarding the flat fees uh, 
Ken, was it was it you that circulated this in December, and we just briefly touched on it then as well? Yes. Yeah. And the one that's in, I, I did. I didn't have a lot of time between the last meeting. I did some tweaks that are in the version that's in the materials this time. Yeah, I'm looking at the red line version, and uh, so I see that. Um, you know, it looks to me uh, like kind of your next step here is to flesh out the analysis of the hypotheticals. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just reading the need to finish an analysis, uh, need examples of uh, bullet uh, points that you make. And then um, this would be in, in a ready for, I think, a more substantive discussion given um, how far along it is. Um, you know, realistically, uh, if we could look at a more substantive uh, version, either for the February or April meetings, I think that's that would um, be terrific. Uh, you know, if not February, maybe April uh, meeting, and that would give us an opportunity to kind of dig in with you and talk about and, and the the subcommittee members um, and give you feedback on, on where you're at here. Does that work for your schedule? Yeah, no, I'd like to you know, shoot for the February one. I could set, I'll set up a meeting with uh, Joel and Brandon. We can flush out those uh, hypotheticals and the analysis and should have something for the next meeting, I think. Okay. If anybody's got any comments in the interim, you know, um, feel free to send them to us or mention something today. Great. Um, I'll just make one comment. Um, you know, I, th I think that uh, the discussion in section two and three probably could be um, shortened a little bit. I think there's a, a couple places where we're talking about the same concepts. Right? And so I, I, you know, if you remove some of those um, duplicate discussions, I think it's going to shorten <laughs> sessions two and three, and then get the, the reader to the hypotheticals and analysis a bit quicker. And I think that would be worth considering, you know, if there's ways to um, to shorten section two and three just a little bit. Because um, right now, it, you know, it's, I think it's a pretty um, clear and straightforward way that you've written it. And so I think it just the next reinforcing layer to making this as, as um, clear as, as a you know, presently reads is just to take out some of the, the redundancy and then get the reader to the analysis um, a bit quicker. So if you have time to to work on that, that's that's really my my only comment at this point because I think it's in good shape and um, okay. it makes a lot of sense and it's helpful. But I think it'll be even more helpful getting the reader to that analysis uh, just a bit quicker. Okay. Does anybody else want to comment on this or have any thoughts on it before we move on? Okay, well then we will shoot for either the um, February or April meeting to have a substantive discussion um, on this um, on this out outline, which which really is actually uh, almost a, a full blown draft. So thanks for your work on this, Ken, and for those who are uh, working with you. Uh, we look forward to discussing it in more detail. So why don't we move then to uh, the other issue outline that we have, twenty one triple zero one. Excuse me, Hunter. Uh, I believe this is um, the sort of more fleshed out version of what you had circulated to us maybe um, two meetings ago, and then um, and then we talked about taking it just a little step a step further, fleshing out a, a bit more and seeing if this is uh, you know taking us in a direction where you you were comfortable you know seeing it as a potential. Opinion or or not. Um, so can you can you give us sort of uh, the background on what you've done here, uh, and and kind of what your what your thoughts are as to whether you feel it would be worth pursuing this um, this issue or this subject further, uh, and fleshing this out more or not? Sure. So as you some of you might recall, the last time we talked, my focus was mostly on 
whether 3.5 or 3.6 really applied to the type of scenario that I described, the type of scenario that's described in kind of the uh, uh, potential hypotheticals. There's the uh, news article there with the uh, belief that trial publicity really is the correct rule to get to get um, or that would govern this. What Justin asked me to do last time was look into the scenarios that I have suggested and do some analysis as to really what would be the outcome of those. Um, looking at the first three, essentially, the more I looked into those, the more it seemed like we're just dealing with very standard uh, professional responsibility, you know, intro to PR type, type questions. You know, you're allowed to respond to accusations uh, to the extent necessary. You're allowed to hold press conferences where you can uh, essentially provide some, some insight into, into the case. And you're not allowed to use pretrial publicity to essentially pollute the jury pool for or against um, your, your case. The third, uh, or I'm sorry, the fourth one I just can't find anything that is directly on point. Um, I can't find a single case that says that an attorney cannot draw into question a, an agency and the way they handle these things. And every time I go down that path, what I find is I am immediately sidetracked onto essentially just a First Amendment law um, track. And that worries me not because First Amendment doesn't have any intersection with professional responsibility, it does, but that we're not here to issue substantive opinions about constitutional law. So that's the extra research that I've done. My conclusion is that as fascinating as this could be, at least the way that I have imagined it, it is more of a First Amendment issue than it is a ethical uh, question. And to the extent that it would be phrased as an ethical question, it would really just be a run of the mill. No, you're not allowed to do these things that are that are taught in a, you know, a first year PR course. Yeah, th thank you for um, sharing your thoughts on, on this and what you've done, Hunter. And um, what, what do you, did, did anyone have a, a different reaction to the issue outline? Did anyone see a a basis for pursuing this um, with an ethics of that might not implicate the First Amendment. Yeah, well, that that was the sort of the reaction I had too, Hunter. Is it, it seems very interesting and I'm sort of curious as to especially one D and how that would play out, but. Um, you know, the question I was asking myself internally is how would you tie this to, you know, an analysis of professional conduct rules and along those lines as, as opposed to getting into maybe other constitutional issues or more like evidence, evidentiary issues that maybe don't have a clear answer. And, you know, it's not, we probably don't want to weigh in on a, a gray area in, in, in rules of evidence, um, which I think are implicated here too. So, um, but I, but I appreciate you fleshing it out and kind of running it down. And, um, you know, maybe this will serve as, as a platform for um, other other ideas um, going forward. Um, does anyone else um, have any anything to say about twenty one triple zero one? But I do I do think that maybe this is one that we um, we table for now. Is that is that kind of your conclusion, Hunter? It is, barring any new case law that comes of any of this stuff, um, which I haven't seen any uh, in the pipe, but there's a potential for it. I think tabling, it's a good idea. Okay, okay. fair enough. So, Justin, so this will come off the agenda for the next meeting then? Yes. And maybe I could add it, re-add it to the uh, potential new opinion topics um, table that we have so we can consider it in the future. That's a great idea. That's okay. a great idea. Thank you. So let me briefly go through, um, I, I am in, of the um, state bars agenda, I'm in 
section C, and, and maybe we can get a brief check-in uh, on some of these uh, ethics outlines that we've discussed preparing um, so the committee knows where we're at. And, and also get a sense of kind of timing wise um, when there might be an outline for, for us to consider so that we can, you know, if, it, if it's gonna be February versus April, we can, we can plan our schedules accordingly and our time in the committee accordingly. So um, the next up that I see here is um, the succession planning uh, opinion. And uh, Dina, do you, do you have a sense of realistically whether April versus February is, is more likely in terms of seeing the, the next iteration? Yeah, I mean, that's, so that one's obviously passed an outline. It has like some section that needs to be fleshed out. And, um, it, you know, we've just been so busy with these. Are, so I'm trying to think of what makes the most sense. I would really, I mean, it would be great for starters while well, if you're talking about if anyone wants to volunteer to be on that committee, um, because right now I think, Justin, it's, is it just you and I? I can't remember. Um, and Joel, Joel volunteered um, Joel Mark as well. On. Okay. Um, so, but I think, you know, I think maybe April, I mean, it's, uh, would be a good point for that because we think we'll be, um, and then that's, that's further along. And I think that there's one section in particular that needs to sort of be fleshed out a little bit more, but, um, you know, I really like to get sort of the new configuration of the committee members, like, seeing that opinion and offering feedback on it. So um, is April seem like an okay target or, I mean, we could do February, it's up to, it depends on the agenda. I mean, I don't wanna to push to do it and then not have us have time to talk about it. So I think that's one of the planning issues, yeah. I, I mean, I'm fine with April. Um, we've got a lot to do um, between now and then, uh, including uh, the symposium that we just discussed. So. Um, and I'll just flag for everyone. I, I just saw that I have unstable internet and it's slowing down on me. So I apologize if you can't hear me at any point. Um, but I'm, I'm fine with April. Um, so that, that's good. And thanks for the update. Um, I don't think Kyle is with us um, to discuss the attorney's I'm here, advocate. I actually popped in oh, okay. just in the nick of time. <laughs> um, so for the attorney as advocate, um, I took that on, did a very bare bones outline, presented it, got some really good feedback, and then just ran out of time to work on it for, for several meetings now. And I think um, I should be able to turn back to it um, for the February meeting, or obviously April would be great um, for more time, but I think February should be fine. And I think I'll just kind of start it back from scratch just because we have new members and um, just uh, kind of reintroduce it, if that sounds good. Justin, are you still with us? I think, I think, I think Justin froze up on us. So I think that's what, that's what happened. Okay. Well, it could be think, deep in thought. <laughs> you're think, right, Ken. He might be deep in thought. Well, I was just wondering if Kyla, you think this opinion is going to go forward? Would you like more drafting team members? Because I believe you're just you're the sole drafter at the moment. I think maybe, if possible, we maybe we could decide that at the next when I uh, I've you, actually okay, flesh it out it. a little more. Yeah, awesome. Okay. I, there was a question um, in my mind, and it seemed like when we were talking about it at the meeting, people were kind of back and forth as well, whether it actually should go forward as an opinion. So um, I wouldn't want to like have people volunteer and not volunteer for other things and then have it, it be a dud. Okay. And you have a preference as to February, April, or because I need to send out the assignments following this meeting pretty quickly. So um, do you I think mean, if if it's if April's okay, then let's do April so I can um, not under not over promise under deliver. But okay. If you do have it ready for the February meeting, go ahead and submit it. But otherwise, if for the assignments, I'll just set it for the April meeting. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. So I guess Sarah, you should take over. <laughs> I, 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 the other um, new opinion okay. that's in yeah, that's outline page that I right. know of. 
Okay. Oh, it looks like Dina forgot to mute. Dina, you need to mute. No, sorry, Justin oh. called me. So I was trying oh, okay. to, he was talking to me and he's got kicked and then I was like going to say something, but then he kept talking. So it didn't mean to, it wasn't like I was taking a personal call during it. He got kicked off his internet. He was thinking um, that- uh, I just this, got back. Oh, there you sorry go. Well, okay. Sorry guys, uh, something's going on with my internet. I don't know if it's the weather. Um, all I heard was Kyla talking and then it went super, super slow and then, and then I was gone. Um, well, Kyla so, is going to prepare an issues outline for the April meeting. Um, and at that time, maybe at that, she can determine whether it should go forward. And th at that time we would add additional subcommittee members or drafting team members for her. Perfect, thank you. Um, why don't we try to knock, knock out the, the, the few others here and then, um, and then we can take a lunch break. Next I have here is um, the in-house council ethics outline, which is uh, right now Sarah and Dina are on that um, committee. Do you have a sense of, I mean, if we're doing the uh, symposium topic on it in April and you want to you know, wait until after the symposium, it gives you ideas or, or, vice, or, or, or maybe you want to work on it um, because it will, you know, now because it'll give ideas in April. I mean, I could see it going either way. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts in terms of timing? Um, Sarah, I'll let you, I mean, I think Ka one thing is Cassidy, uh, I, I think volunteered to join our committee, yeah. right? Yeah, no, I, I'd love to join it. And also I was thinking is, 11, is number 11, 21008, can that be subsumed within that same opinion? Isn't that the same kind of topic? In-house lawyer compensation? There's, looks like there's two outlines that are, that touch on in-house lawyer. Yeah, I'm not I aware. have no idea what that is. Yeah, I'm not aware of it either, the in-house lawyer compensation one. Well, I think, I mean, it would have to do with possibly, uh, you know, like stock options where the in-house lawyer is being offered stock options and that's a financial transaction with the client and the conflict, the need for a conflict waiver. But um, other than that, it, but I think they would, they're basic, they can fall under the same opinion. As, as, um, let me look at what that was. It was a new opinion request that you guys considered at your September meeting, it looks like. Um, give me one second, I'm pulling up the document that elaborates. Now, Joel Mark was assigned to that, it appears. Joel, is that correct? Uh, Joel, who was that? I'm sorry. Um, on the agenda, it is item C11. Oh. Wait, I don't have the agenda. Just tell me what it was. It was um, in-house lawyer compensation. Oh, yeah. I, I recall that there were two cases that I looked at, and they were sort of conflicting. It was an interesting topic, but I didn't, in my mind, mature to a, uh, a, a an opinion. So I've kind of dropped it. OK. So you can probably eliminate that one and then just include compensation as part of the 003. Well, any, but anyway, I, I would love to serve on the subcommittee. I, I find this topic really interesting and I've, I've had a number of in-house lawyer clients in the past year that um, I've grappled with these issues. So it would be nice to work on it um, in this context. Yeah, that sounds great. And just as a brief um, update, Dina and I worked on an outline, um, and we haven't had a chance to update it. The main, the primary issue that we need to do is narrow it. I think we have a lot of, a lot of issues that we discussed that I can't remember. It's, it's been maybe four meetings back where we discussed that the initial outline, and um, it's, it's a little, it's too broad, I think. To, and so we're, we're trying to focus on kind of the primary issues and narrow it, and we need to work on that. So. I think just as a subcommittee and Justin, you raised the issue about timing. Um, I think it'd be great if we could try to make some progress before the symposium, particularly if this might be a, a topic um, for the symposium. So um, I, I don't know about Cassidy and Dina, but I, I would I would like to try to aim if we were able to for the February meeting to try to do a revised outline and, and narrow and, and focus the issues. 
Yeah, I think I that's a great idea, Sarah. I, I think, but I, I also wonder too, with, I mean, we did a lot of sort of, our, our outline is more like overview. I just wondered if, I mean, we can narrow it a little bit down, um, but I also wonder if since it's a new configuration of the committee, we might get some more energized ideas about a better path to take it by just sort of discussing very similarly that outline again, right? Because it was fleshed out. It just had probably, it was a lot to cover. It would have been like the overview of like probably 20 pages, which we <laughs> probably don't want to do, right? So, you know, we can talk as a subcommittee about certain directions it could take, but we also might want to get the feedback of the larger committee about issues in conjunction with thinking about the symposium that might be more interesting to flesh out in more detail. That, that makes good sense to me. You don't feel like you need to, you know, make the decisions about what to keep or remain at this point. I think having um, a broader set of potential topics that we can di then discuss as a committee is, is great. So um, if you end up having a, a broader outline than, you know, it's ultimately going to be, uh, I think that's, that's not just fine. I think that might be helpful at this stage. Okay, so February for that. Okay, great. Um, Cassidy, we'll circulate that to you. Sounds good. Thanks. And then, uh, forgive me, Hunter, I'm not entirely sure where we are with the uh, other two here for you. 21444, ethical obligations of a deportation attorney. Um, I think you and Cassidy exchanged some emails, and I apologize for not chiming in because um, I was copied. Um, that's my bad. Um, but it sounds like you, you, if I'm remembering the email correctly, um, you, you're still kind of playing with that and, and might flesh something out for either February or April. Yeah, I, uh, I interviewed a um, an immigration attorney who's actually moving his he's leaving his practice to become an ALJ. I got some background on that, and then I moved over to focus on 21 triple uh, or five. So that is something I plan to flesh out essentially for next meeting. Um, it's, I, I don't have it for this meeting, but I have started work on that. Perfect. And then for 21555, uh, can you give us an update on, on that? Yeah, I submitted an issue outline on that one. Yes, it's part of the agenda material. Oh, I, I apologize. I must have missed it. Uh, that was one that you listed as possibly being discussed if there was time by 20 triple oh five. Is it 21 triple oh five? Oh, 21 triple oh five. Sorry. It's at the bottom of your schedule for the day, Justin. Uh, and that's 20 triple oh five contingency fee agreements. That's a different. Uh, oh, is that what so it, says, it, it says on the agenda? It says 21. 001, um, but, but the link is for 0005. Ah, okay, there it is. Maybe that's what it was meant, sorry. Okay, so just to clarify, with respect to the criminal defense attorney disclosure obligations, <laughs> where, where are we with that, Hunter? I've got an issue outline, and, okay. um, and I'll, I'll just briefly take you through it, if that's okay, Justin. Um, has it been circulated yet? To the group or it, it is in the agenda. The, it's oh, in the it agenda. Okay. Then I just then I just missed it. Then, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, the issues or questions that I had were um, more specific, um, almost like they were um, uh, uh, situations as opposed to just questions, because it's kind of a broad question. For those of you who who remember uh, the Meredith case under which this question came up was a case in which there was a murder case. The defense sent out an investigator based on confidential communications from their client. The investigator seized the evidence and then was essentially asked to turn over the evidence that was in their possession because of a confidential communication. The Meredith case basically held that, yes, um, when a confidential communication leads to discovery of evidence, there is uh, the, the, the privilege applies uh, to information like that, but if a criminal defense attorney and their agent interfere with, a, with essentially the prosecution's ability to go find that evidence, or if they alter the evidence in some way, then uh, other steps must be taken. So generally, it set out a pretty 
fairly easy to follow standard where defense attorneys, if they're made aware of evidence through confidential communications, can go out with their investigator, look at it, see it, examine it as long as they're not altering it or moving it. And it basically puts the ball in their court as a, uh, as a tactical decision. Do I pick this up and, and hand it over and tell them, you know, this is where I heard, this is where we got this information from, or do we leave it alone? And that tactical decision becomes theirs. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, question. The only thing that I found that would really be unanswered is this question that was uh, coming up in cases that were citing the Meredith case, which is what happens when an agent of the criminal defendant at the criminal defendant's behest delivers the evidence to the criminal defense attorney. So when a criminal defendant provides confidential information and it leads to the discovery of the evidence, there's the tactical decision. When the criminal defendant merely provides the information, we still have that issue of the criminal defense attorney can't legally withhold that from the prosecution. And part of that is uh, the, the rules saying that, you know, fairness to, to opposing counsel. But another is Penal Code Section 135, which is withholding in, uh, evidence uh, that is to be produced at a criminal hearing. So those are some very strong uh, legal concepts behind you have to turn this over, but you might be protected from where it came from. The, then the third party, if somebody who wants to help out the defendant just as a third party finds this evidence and turns it over, there's, there's no confidential communication. So there's nothing there that is protected. A couple of the cases said in dicta that that might be different if the third party were acting as an agent of the criminal defendant. But the case that really talked about that, the case that really explored that, um, which I believe was the Zimmerman case, which is cited in the issue outline, basically said, look, that's dicta. We don't have it here. We don't have enough information to know how that would be handled. And frankly, uh, kind of a review of it just logically suggests that it should be handled in the same way it would be handled under Meredith itself. So all that to say, I don't think there's an issue here. This is just kind of an introductory um, def criminal defense disclosures uh, that, you, that you might get in an introductory PR course. And not, nothing groundbreaking. Unless anybody's reviewed the issue outline and thinks I'm missing something. Yeah, you know, we, we were talking to past each other earlier, Hunter, because I, I had pulled up a version of the what you just showed that for some reason said 21001, but obviously we're talking about 0005. Um, and so when I when I was making comments earlier, I thought we were talking about what you, <laughs> what you just put up. Um, so my, my comments apply to here as well. Um, I was not sure that we would, you know, what what the sort of ethical focus would be here, um, that we could, you know, prepare a full full blown opinion on, um, because it does seem to implicate um, evidentiary issues and penal code issues and things along those lines that um, that wouldn't necessarily be ethically focused, um, though interesting. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying yeah, for this one as well is um, interesting issue, but maybe not worth uh, pursuing. Or do you think that there is an avenue here to pursue a further? Right, I agree. Our our, our opinion would would be to copy and paste the the Meredith case. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's a simple opinion. We would get one out the door pretty quickly. But uh, <laughs> yeah. A anyone else have a different or additional thoughts on that? Okay, well then why don't we um, why don't we defer 21 triple zero five and put that back on the proposed topic list as well. Uh, um, okay. All right, just looking at the time. Okay, 1221. So rather than um, start a new 
a new agenda item. Why don't we pause for break just to give everybody a heads up. Uh, most likely we'll skip 200004, ethical duties when working remotely. Uh, I think that opinion is really close to being voted out. Um, you know, at least for me personally, I had just a, a few wordsmithing type of um, edits that I'd rather make sure I get to Sarah um, to, and, and others to consider um, so that we're able to present a close to ready to be voted out uh, opinion and, and um, have all our edits down. And I would say I would, I would encourage everybody to take a really hard look at 200004 and provide any you know, further and final comments, edits to Sarah, um, because it's it's in excellent shape, it's really close, and we might be in a position in February to vote it out. And so anything we can do to support um, Sarah and her, and her um, team on this to get it um, ready for that vote, I think would be, um, would be very, very helpful. And I'll, I'll plan to send you my comments, Sarah, um, after the meeting. Um, in terms of the afternoon, um, I'm going to start off by turning us back to the prayer professional rules draft letter. Um, we would very much welcome everybody's feedback to the extent you have it, um, whether it's substantive or, or not, so that we can get that letter in tip top shape because we have to get it um, to the paraprofessional working group and basically finalize this month. Um, so I want to start there after lunch. Hopefully the lunch break will be an opportunity to, to take a look at that and, and offer feedback um, so that we can make that as um, uh, you know, uh, shiny and polished, but also substantive um, and meaningful as possible. And then from there, we'll, we'll follow the agenda um, as it's written. And then um, if we have time between the contingency fee agreement and expert witness outlines, I would expect We'll take up the contingency fee agreement um, the outline if we have time. So that's what I see uh, on tap. Um, so it's 12:23. Why don't we come back? You know, a few minutes before 1:30, uh, so like 1:25, and that gives us an hour uh, to um, go through the rest of the agenda. So one went back at 1:25. That works for everybody, okay? 1:25. Got it meeting. Okay, we are live. All right, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, before we get started with the paraprofessional rules, I just want to say thank you to everybody, including the state bar staff who's here. I know that um, the last couple of weeks, especially things have <clears throat> not taken the turn that we all hoped for in the world. And I know that um, we all have uh, other personal and professional obligations and pressures that we're all dealing with. And so to get together like this and have these meetings and keep this consistency and moving forward, it's, uh, it's tougher, but we're doing it and we can't do it without um, everyone's participation and the support of um, the state bar staff who are here. So thank you all so much. I just wanna say that, acknowledge that we're all working through hard circumstances and, and really thank you um, for all that you all are doing. Um, I'm hoping that um, some of you might have had a chance to look at the paraprofessional rules uh, letter and might have some um, comments. I did receive a couple emails with some feedback, which I appreciate uh, over the lunch break and we'll incorporate that. What I'm, what I'm thinking is that we'll um, maybe have a brief discussion here, see, see what if any feedback committee members have. And then given the timing that we need to submit our letter <clears throat> uh, before the February meeting to my knowledge, um, I think that the procedure would be for us to, uh, and, and Mimi, Randy, you can tell me if I have this wrong, um, is to take some kind of vote to approve um, the letter subject to um, the understanding that the, um, the, those working on the letter are probably going to refine it and, and update it before it's circulated to the uh, paraprofessional working group. Or do we not need to vote on it? No, we should vote on the approval of public comment letters that we submit. 
Good. Okay. So that'll be the the, the final step in our discussion uh, on this. So um, with that, uh, does anybody have comments or questions uh, regarding the letter to share? Uh, I had a quick question uh, <clears throat> on page two regarding proposed rule 1.0. Uh, I, I don't recall, I, I don't remember what the discussion was. I don't know if it, it occurred before we started or, or before I started on the board or not. Um, the removal of the, the phrase legal profession in that rule, um, what is the paraprofessional, what is that called? Is that considered part of the legal profession? And if so, why would we take that out? that's what's in the, the lawyer's rule, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> you're right. It is in the lawyer's rule. And as I was going through this, um, uh, I had the same thought on that. I'm, I, I am also thinking that this is one of those phrases that we might um, find, a, you know, it might be a head scratcher for some, but it is in the lawyer rule, and they are trying to parallel the lawyer rule. And I think it's fair to say that the paraprofessionals are within the legal profession. And so um, for that reason, you know, subject to the input of other committee members, I think, you know, thinking further about that phrase, we might, in, in its context, we might omit this recommendation uh, in the final letter. But, but I'd like to hear from others there are other possibilities. I guess the, the other alternative could be too, is we could, as opposed to saying the legal profession, maybe to say the paraprofessional profession, maybe an option. You want to keep that comment. Well, just in context, I think that legal profession is broader, and I think that it's intended to be broad. Um, want to protect the whole legal profession, so um, you know, for that reason, I, I, I'm I'm comfortable with the language as as is, and I don't feel strongly that that this would need to be the very first recommendation that we make in our letter, um, particularly um, given the, the I think the effort by the working group to be uh, parallel here with the um, statement in 1.0 in the lawyer rule. So. Um, well, was the thinking in deleting that phrase to, you know, I guess, to avoid the impression that paraprofessional rules are designed to protect lawyers? Yes, <laughs> I believe so, yes. Because I think that's a, a major concern and kind of like globally on this issue is lawyers trying to protect lawyers and um, with, with stated opposition to the paraprofessional program throughout the community, I think it draws attention to people who are concerned that lawyers are out to protect lawyers. And if you're regulating paraprofessionals for, in order to protect the lawyer professionals, that could be problematic and it just might be incendiary language, even if that is a, um, could be a worthy objective, it might detract from the less incendiary objectives um, for people that might take it upon themselves to interpret it that way. Yeah, that's how I read it. I mean, I, I didn't have an issue with deleting the phrase. I mean, okay, let me play devil's advocate here. If we were starting from a clean slate, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, these concerns might have been raised and the rules of professional conduct for lawyers might have been drafted differently. Um, but, um, you know, given that we have this language in the, the lawyer rules and that it Someone <laughs> who drafted those rules in the Supreme Court have concluded it's not, shouldn't be read in the incendiary fashion. 
but rather just as a general statement that the rules are intended to protect, as it says, the courts, the public, and the legal profession. Um, you know, and, and that um, to to omit to propose omitting that phrase in the paraprofessional rules, even though it exists and is part of the landscape of the lawyer rules, that's that's the um, challenge I think we have in, in advocating this omission here. And I think we would, if we were to advocate that omission, I think we'd have to acknowledge that what we were proposing is not parallel to the lawyer rule and explain why we think um, this should be omitted in the paraprofessional rule, even though it's included in the lawyer rule. And, and at least as drafted, we haven't, we haven't gone that far and we haven't articulated that, um, the proposal for not being parallel with 1.0 in the lawyer rule, and, and you know. Yeah, the, but I don't know, rule one in the, in the lawyer rules, I mean, it, it has more than they have in the professional, in the paraprofessional rules. I mean, it talks about the profession, the integrity of the system, the administration of justice, I don't know, playing devil's advocate to your devil's advocate, I think, you know, one could argue that this is basically saying these rules are designed to protect lawyers from paraprofessionals. So, I don't think it's a make or break for me, but I, I did. I, that's how I read it when you when I first saw this. Uh, that's why I didn't really have an issue with the waiting. Because this doesn't mirror Rule 1.0 completely of the rules of conduct. Um, so the paraprofessional rule includes all that other language you just mentioned. Protect the integrity of the legal system, promote administrative strength of justice and confidence in the legal profession. All of that is in the proposed rule for paraprofessionals. So even if we were to omit the reference to legal profession in the sentence that we've identified in our letter, there's still the reference in the paraprofessional rule to promotion of the administration of justice and confidence in the legal profession, which I think is intended to be um, reinforcing of what, we, what the rule means when it talks about legal profession in the sentence um, that we're talking about right now. So, um, you know, again, I, I do think that it mirrors um, 1.0 in the lawyer rule. And, and um, at least I'm not, I'm not persuaded yet that we've articulated a strong enough explanation for why this one, Laws should be omitted from 1.0 in the paraprofessional rules when read in the full context of the proposed profession, paraprofessional rule. I'm, I'm happy to be persuaded and we could consider some draft language, but I think we need a real strong justification for not being parallel with 1.0 in the lawyer rule because a proposal like that is going to stand out to our, um, our uh, audience in the paraprofessional working group program, and I think we would need to persuade them that this clause should be omitted um, in, in a meaningful way, and I don't, I don't think we're there yet. So um, I just, agree with you, Jess. Oh, sorry. I'm just thinking if, if, if we want to pursue this further, you know, I would invite, um, you know, potential proponents of omitting that um, clause to draft up some language. Um, that we could consider plugging in here uh, or considering, but uh, you know, at this point, you know, I, you know, my inclination is um, maybe this isn't our our first and lead uh, point in our letter, um, subject to uh, being persuaded otherwise. I, I agree with that position. I think that I, I think it should mirror the uh, the rules, the legal professions rules, and I think because there's so many other items listed that are objectives to why the rules are important it's it's not just like it's not like protection of legal profession in the sense of protectionism there is integrity in the legal profession there is a standard to maintain you know that you want to make sure that the profession represents the best of what 
you know, what we are as lawyers. And I, and I think in the context of protecting the public and the courts and all the other descriptions of what the rules are supposed to do that I don't personally have a problem with including that in there. And I think it mirrors the attorney's rules. And I agree with you, Justin, that we should have a rationale for why we would take that particular phrase out um, if we were gonna recommend that. So I would be in favor of not including that um, as, a, as, as part of the letter. I thought that what Elizabeth had said about um, the just the the reasoning for why it's incendiary made a lot of sense to me. So I I agree that the way that it is in the letter right now doesn't communicate that. And when I read the draft letter, I thought, why are we taking that out? But then as soon as it was explained, I was like, yeah, I I do think that there is a difference between the phrases protect the public, the courts, and the legal profession versus promote the administration of justice and confidence in the legal profession or the integrity of the legal system. Um, whereas protecting the legal profession, I, I, it didn't uh, occur to me right away, but I do, um, I now am seeing that as, um, we, we, we talk about ourselves as legal professionals. I don't know if paraprofessionals refer to themselves as legal professionals, but I think of legal professionals as lawyers. So um, I can see how that would be problematic. But I do agree that we, if, if that's the stance, then that needs to be spelled out because the way that it is right now, it's not really spelled out. I would agree with that, and I, I needing to spell it out more. But I feel like the having the language in there to promote the administration of justice and confidence in the legal profession is more than adequate, it, and and it doesn't raise this other potential interpretation that we're protecting lawyers. Um, I agree with that. So if you have that other language, why do you need protect the legal profession? You don't need it. It also um, is a modifier for protecting the public and the courts. And the one way that you do that is promoting administration of justice and confidence in the legal profession. You know, again, I don't wanna repeat myself, but I, all of that makes sense to me. And I, I, I completely understand the position and how, how this language could be read or misconstrued um, to suggest that the rules are about protecting lawyers and, and along those lines. Um, but because we're not operating you know, with a clean slate, and this is the language that exists in the lawyer rule, um, <clears throat> you know, it, we're gonna get pushback, right? From, from proposing something that's not parallel. Um, so what I would, what I would ask is um, for any, any proponents of omitting this, uh, I think we heard from Elizabeth and Kyla and Ken, um, if you could, um, you know, draft up some language that could be considered explaining why it is we're, we would be proposing um, language that's not parallel here and a concern, um, that would be helpful. Um, because again, as, as, as um, it's not enough, I think, what we, let's put it this way. It's not enough what we have in our draft letter to, I think, persuade our audience that they should omit their language and differ from the lawyer rules. And at least personally, I'm not, I'm not persuaded yet, um, but I, I, will, I will keep an open mind because I do understand the concern. It's just that um, like many things in the law, we're not operating on a clean slate and maybe we would have done it differently uh, had we been uh, there um, with, the, with the rules revisions and, and all of that. But uh, unfortunately, most of us weren't. So I would I would just invite you to um, to wordsmith something and sure. send it to me, and um, and then we can figure out the next step um, and, and whether it makes sense to um, include this uh, comment. Does that work? Sure thing. Okay. I would say Mimi just add Elizabeth to that list because she articulated it far better than I did. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks, Bill, for uh, highlighting that. I appreciate it. Um, that was a good discussion. 
Um, what what else? What else in this letter um, would members like to discuss? Um, I'll go again. I, I as I was going through this, um, the proposed rule one point four point two, the the, the the language underneath that. Are, are they trying to suggest the the prospective client's native language? You know, you know, I see the reference maybe. And, and the right question is, you know, what they speak multiple languages. I, mean, I, I don't know what they're thinking. It seems like they're trying to suggest whatever the person's native language is. For instance, if you have a, you know, a Spanish speaking client who also has some, some limited English, I mean, the native language would be Spanish, right? Maybe that's what they're referring to. I don't know. But I think your questions that are, that are raised are very prudent. Um, which made me think a little further, and this may be a, something for another day, but because the question that's posed in the, uh, or state in the last statement in the second paragraph there, it says, you know, it says it's further unclear why a licensed paraprofessional would have this obligation, but lawyers do not with respect to other rules that require disclosure and or informed written consent. Um, I've defended legal malpractice cases where there was a Spanish speaking plaintiff or former client that had a fee agreement that was written in English. Um, and the person didn't speak a lick of English. Um, shouldn't we as lawyers also be required to, I mean, I think there should be a requirement that if there's someone who is a, my example, a Spanish speaking is their primary language individual that any communication or certainly the fee agreement or this notice should be in Spanish or uh, and that should apply to lawyers as well. Um, hey Bill, or, we talked about that at the last meeting, at least for fee agreements, there's a specific statute on that. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I've, that, my note to myself is it's not in 6147 or 6148 that has to be in the native language of the client, unless I oh. missed it. I, I don't think it is. No, the, uh, there's a statute that says fee agreements, uh, if they're negotiated and it lists several languages. Oh. You have yeah. to provide it in both that language and in English. Then I, 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 then this should be the paraprofessional should have something. Their rule should maybe, as we talk in other, you know, within the meaning of that BNP code section, maybe that should be a, a, a comment that should be included in this rule if there is you know, multiple languages or, or the primary language is not English. Just some thoughts there. I was thinking of as I was reading through this. Um, that's that's helpful, Ken. You know, um, I looked at the uh, code provisions. At least I thought I looked at all the code provisions that were referenced in our December meeting, and I didn't see a code provision as specific as what you just mentioned. So if you have a chance, Ken, to yeah, I thought uh, I sent you the to run that down, yeah, okay. and maybe if you if if we had it before and I just missed. The right one, but if there is a code provision that says fee agreements for lawyers need to be in X language and then also potentially Y language, I'd like to see that code provision because um, maybe there is a proposal to be made that, um, which is I think what we're getting at in that last sentence of the second paragraph that Bill highlighted, which is look, shouldn't the obligation be consistent at, for um, agreements as between paraprofessionals and lawyers. And so maybe there's there's a proposal we can make there that we can tie to a BNP code. Um, so if you don't have yeah, that handy, we could that, track that down. Yeah. Great. yeah, I gave it last one, and I don't, but I don't have my notes, but I'll pull it up here. Okay. Because yeah. um, maybe I wrote the number down wrong, but I, have just, I didn't see that. Yeah, there's, there's also um, something about language and the comments to the advertising rules for lawyers that right. uh, has to be looked at. And then when you were all discussing this, it, do we um, cover the base adequately if we change preferred to requested? That was the discussion we had last time was what does preferred mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree that it's ambiguous in the sense that Okay, if you speak six languages and you you happen to think that um, you know French is the most beautiful, um, that's your preferred language. But um, 
does requested A do it and B, is that clear enough? Or it, does putting the burden upon the client to request too much? Those are, that's. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. The um, I think requested goes uh, is a step clearer than preferred because it it confirms that the client is going to be conveying the language that he, he or she prefers, right? Whereas the prospective client's preferred language will, you know, there's a question of well, how do you ascertain that? What do you need to do to ascertain it? Is that is it the lawyer's best guesstimate as to what the preferred language is? Requested is much clearer, but you know we'll have to look at the paraprofessional language in the rule. If 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 we if we proposed requested language, there there would probably have to be a trigger there that the that the lawyer would need to ascertain with that 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 there is an issue um, in terms of finding out what what the preferred language is and and having the the client provide that information because obviously a client isn't going to be aware that they have the right to request you know a language that they actually can understand um, unless that's conveyed to them um, so there are some nuances here I think to um, to think about in terms of um, enhancing our, our feedback to the uh, working group I uh, found so that that's, that's, that's interesting uh, the statute is Civil Code 1632, specifically subsection B. 1632, hold on, it's under 1.5. Would we put it under this section? Okay. Sorry, uh, what was it? Civil, Civil, Civil Code 1632. It's not just for fee agreements, but it's been applied to that, but it says any person engaged in a trader business who negotiates primarily in Spanish, Chinese, Tagalog, Vietnamese, or Korean in the course of any contract have to provide the contract a translation in that language as well as English. So. But that's the, that's the statute that's been applied to fee agreements. Well, then I think you'd add, or such other language as the client may request. That's not a complete list of. No, that's the list that's in this particular statute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's actually B six thirty two. 1632B6 is where they apply it to fee agreements. Oh, yes. Well, I think that's a, at least a nice, um, you know, hook from the, from the um, civil code to the extent that um, <clears throat> As with the BMP code, it may not necessarily apply, but the paraprofessional rules are trying to say within the spirit um, or intent of these provisions that are at least analogous, the paraprofessionals should do X, Y, or Z is, is, a, is a phraseology that I think we're trying to suggest to the working group they should consider since they don't have a statutory scheme to rely upon. And then they'll have to obviously make their, their own call as to whether they like that type of approach. But I think that it's at least one alternative for clarifying this prospective client's preferred language um, phrase. And, and so I think that you know, we may not come to a conclusion as to what the, the most precise, accurate language is, but I think that we would want to um, Add discussion here to 16 about 1632B um, to offer alternatives and additional information from which the working group can um, consider revising the, the language that they have right now. So this this is this is excellent, and I think that we should incorporate it to our our letter. There's also a good discussion uh, that, that in Joel's 
attorney's fee practically and ethically outlined too. So give Joel a plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, but getting back to the issue or such other language as the client may request, I just recall a, I was an arbitrator that was referred by the rabbinical court and the whole issue was whether the contract what the words in Hebrew meant. And I had no clue what they meant, but that's what they were arguing over, but they had requested that. So I think we ought to add some flexibility or additions possible. Yes, I think when we wordsmith this, we should um, have a discussion of 1632, identify it, and also uh, make reference to the requested language and why that might be something for the working group to consider um, in, in reformulating what they currently have. Um, so that, that to me, unless someone disagrees, uh, I agree with you, Joel, that we should, we should offer that alternative language, additional language uh, for the working group to consider. Anything else on 1.4.2? This is this is excellent um, discussion. This is really helpful. Um, uh, Randy has his hand raised. Oh, I see. Yes. I just wanted to mention that I think I might have been in, in attendance at the uh, Power Professional Working Group meeting when the phrase preferred language uh, was mentioned. I believe it comes from Evidence Code Section 1129C1. Uh, Evidence Code Section 1129 addresses the mediation confidentiality disclosure that is required by statute to assure that the parties to a mediation uh, realize that it's uh, ultra confidential when you participate in a mediation. And the language of the disclosure form that is required by statute is to be under uh, 1129C1 printed in the quote, preferred language of the client in at least 12 point font. So I believe that was the inspiration for the use of the preferred language phrase in the proposed rule that you're reviewing now. And that's that's something that actually came up in our last meeting too, that, that code section may be um, informative. So that raises an interesting question as to whether, in light of the fact that they've modeled this language after Evidence Code 1129, it's, it's still a different standard than what applies to um, contracts, as we saw in Civil Code 1632, as well as the standard that applies to lawyers. And so do we, so, certainly understandable where they came up with this language, um, but do we, are we comfortable with that, with there being a, a sort of a higher standard in terms of providing different language um, fee agreements when you're a paraprofessional as compared to the obligation that a lawyer might have? I think, Justin, if I may, I think it makes sense to suggest that it be modeled off of 1632, that, that language choice be modeled off of that as opposed to the evidence code section. And part of that is just because of interpretation later on. Um, I think there's more likely to be within the wheelhouse of professional responsibility more um, backing on 1632 than in the evidence code section. I could be wrong, but I think there's just going to be, um, it would be more informative. So I think to the extent that we're going to suggest anything, we might suggest that they model their language after 1632 and those concepts as opposed to modeling it after the evidence code. That's my initial thought. And, and it, it makes sense to me. And at the very least, I think, as I was suggesting um, earlier, at the very least, I think we want to acknowledge that, and thank you, Randy, that we, we 
hopefully we understand where this language came from. Um, it makes, while it makes sense to us, we understand the, the purpose, here are some alternatives to consider. Because again, it's not our choice, but I think you know, not knowing the, the, the analysis that went into concluding this was the best language, I think um, you know, it's uh, incumbent upon us to offer these alternatives and um, you know, offer some, some, some points as to why they might wanna consider language that more aligns with 1632. Than 1129 um, to make sure that they've you know, at least had the opportunity to consider that alternative language. So we, we may not come out as strongly and say, you know, this we, we disagree with this language per se, but I think that we should refine this to offer these alternatives um, for consideration. Does that does that make sense to folks? I'll take that as a yes. Um, what else, if anything, on 1.4.2? Again, this is tremendously helpful. The other, the other point I wanted to raise um, on that particular one was on, on page four, the last paragraph of, of our comments uh, regarding paragraph A, it's paragraph A line four. Um, I don't have the proposal sitting in front of me, so I'm just kind of just going off the, the context of the comment, um, given the comment, it sounds like the requirement of this, this notice requires oral plus written disclosures. Is that, is that, is that correct? Yeah, so I, I don't remember the specific language, but at least with respect to a number of the disclosure obligations to clients or prospective clients, there's um, this sort of pre-written engagement disclosure requirement where paraprofessionals are supposed to orally tell the prospective client certain things. And then uh, on top of that, there are disclosures, um, some of which are duplicative, that are, then are required um, in the written engagement. So I think that's what that's referencing. Okay, um, I guess my concern um, with that is really from a, a text more of a protective posture in, in, in the sense of why, I mean, I think our recommendation is my, you know, this is my two cents. I don't know if our recommendation wants to give any leeway to allowing oral disclosure. I think we ought to limit it to recommending that it should just be written disclosure. Um, if you have to do both, then, you know, some of say, well, I, that never happened, but, you know, they never told me that. It happens all the time in living my practice. It, it, yeah, I advised him to do X, Y, and Z. He didn't do it. Uh, and then there's a dispute in living my practice saying he never did. He never told me that. So I think limiting it you, by just recommending maybe they should just stick to written disclosure and kind of avoid that issue. Uh, you have it in writing. Um, that, that's my only two cents. I think the recommendation should be should, they should maybe get rid of the oral disclosure. Part of that, and just, and then just stick with the written disclosure. Yeah, uh, that that's that's a helpful comment for this paragraph because I think maybe we've danced around our point a little bit too much um, in some of our comments about the oral versus written. I think overall in these um, comments, what we're trying to convey is we think that the written disclosures are more important and imperative, and that. When, when there are duplicative disclosures required that are both oral and written, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to create confusion and inconsistency. And as you say, the, the written disclosures are, you know, as a practical matter, going to be more important, I think, both for the client to have something in writing that's tangible, but also protective of the um, paraprofessional. You know, so it doesn't turn into the he said, she said that we often see in, uh, you know, professional liability disputes. So I think we just need to be a little more clear. 
Well, I'm sorry, is there a consequence if they don't do the disclosures here or? Well, kind of, uh, with Bill, it reminds me like, you know, with the fee agreements, you know, you can sign the fee agreement, the, the client can sign the fee agreement, but if you don't provide the duplicate copy, then you could void it. You know, and here, if you can provide you, if you provide them the detailed written disclosure that completely covers all those issues and has it in their preferred language or, or however, if there's some consequence for not complying and the client, you know, could void whatever agreement by saying, well, you put it in writing, but you didn't tell me that, um, you know, that just seems kind of counterproductive. Well, you know, I, I get what you're saying with respect to sort of a um, like a precision argument, but but just even not from a professional conduct perspective, in terms of yeah. consequences, what what these rules are setting up potentially with all these oral disclosures is theoretically um, paraprofessionals are going to be subject to to discipline, right? Because these are disciplinary rules, unless I'm misunderstanding, for failing to give an oral disclosure, but then providing it in, in writing instead um, doesn't, um, I think there's a one of the concerns that we have is um, consistent application of oral disclosures, right? Uh, it's, it's much easier to track disclosures that are in writing. Did they happen? Did they not happen? Uh, for, from a client pr protective perspective, it's much easier to under understand and track those disclosures uh, and, and refer back to them. Um, so the, the concept that theoretically licensed paraprofessionals could be subject to discipline because they didn't give an oral disclosure that they also have to give in writing for the rules is, um, it's a bit of a head scratcher. And, and I think our reaction is basically, we understand in concept the idea of being super protective, making sure there are disclosures all over the place, oral and written, but let's be, um, let's be narrow and smart about when we're requiring oral disclosures and not put too much of an onus on paraprofessionals about oral disclosures if it's not necessary, if it's not parallel to what lawyers have to do and is gonna create either confusion or theoretical discipline when such a threat isn't necessary. And I think that's one of the overarching themes we're trying to convey. And maybe again, we do it a little bit circuitously um, rather than directly, but I appreciate the concern you're raising. I think it's something we're trying to convey here, um, but maybe need to, to do a better job of it. Uh, any, any other um, comments uh, on either 1.4.2 or any of the other um, Proposed rules. I just had a, a, one clarification on the uh, comments of proposed rule 1.4.3, the fourth paragraph that starts with paragraph A3 does not contemplate. I think the quoted language where it says we recommend inserting in paragraph A2. Or with the prospective lawyer, that is supposed to be the prospective client. Yeah. Good catch. Sorry, you, he was breaking up. So, what am I changing in this? Where, where it says we recommend inserting in paragraph A2, it's that yep. the quote starts should be the prospective client as opposed to lawyer. And that is um, just double checking what they actually have in their proposed yeah, I'm checking right now. rule, A2. A2, this is 1.4.3, right? 
or one point, yeah, one point four point three. Yeah. A two. Why is this different? Oh, A A four. I thought it was A three. A three. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, am I miss? Yeah, A three. Sorry. A three. The potential. Yeah. Power. Yeah. So in their proposed rule. It's blank. It just says the potential need to hire um, a lawyer. Yes. And, and, and you this want to add a new paragraph. Got it. So you want to insert in A2 or in A3 the prospective client may need? Because here you wrote A2. I think it's a three. I think so. It is supposed to be a three. So this should be a three. Prospective client. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> yep. So that, yeah, this is supposed to be a three, not a two. Right. Okay. Uh, other comments? Um, I think that the preferred language appears in a couple of these rules. So I think we just need to refer back to that initial comment about that. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking we'll have one one shtick the first time, and then we'll just refer back both yep. for that and any other times where we're kind of saying the same, making the same comment. Yeah, let me make a note of that. Where, oh, where did it <clears> go? <throat> Here, so, so what is that? Well, Mimi's doing that. I'll, I'll just say, you know, I, I appreciate that it is um, a bit challenging to give Feedback on this letter, you know, part of the challenge that we confronted is that there are no comments yet to these rules and it still seems based on some of the typos and black parallelism and things like that, that they're not quite finalized. And so I, I would expect that when we get, hopefully we will get proposed rules with comments in some other iteration and I'm hopeful that that will be another opportunity as we know them front of this letter um, to provide substantive comments where we can see the whole context of these proposed rules. So um, we've, we've tried to give substantive feedback where we can, but, but a lot of our comments are stylistic and missing words and things like that to help you know, clean up um, what they have so far. And then I think there'll be another round where we can weigh in substantively. So um, I don't see this as the be all end all in terms of our Public comment here, but more of an opening salvo to provide hopefully helpful feedback. Um, any 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 other comments? Okay. Well, this is uh, this is great. Thank you, everyone. Um, appreciate it, uh, Justin. Justin, yeah, Toby. Um, I had had a question for staff as to whether there had been any update on the status of uh, 5.4 with the closing the justice gap working group because it sort of, until they decide what to do, it sort of precludes anything here. Um, let me mention that uh, the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group is a separate project from the activities of the California Power Professional Working Group. The Power Professional Working Group was much further along in their activities and submitted a report that included proposed rules of professional conduct for power professionals, which are a part of the public comment proposal that has the deadline of January 12th, which is you know, why we're prioritizing the completion of COPRAC's comment letter on this topic. With regard to the separate activities of the um, other group, the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group, 
Um, one of their primary tasks was to develop a regulatory sandbox for considering innovative delivery systems and products and services uh, for expanding access to legal services. And letter was received by the state bar from the chairs of the Senate Assembly Judiciary Committee of the legislature, expressing concerns about the work of that group and stating in essence that any uh, proposal for a regulatory sandbox would be you know, heavily scrutinized uh, by uh, the legislature. In light of that, uh, the state bar is evaluating its present activities with the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group. The meetings that had been previously scheduled for December and January uh, were suspended, and the board will be taking a look at one of its future meetings at making a final determination as to the work of that group. And so the power professional activity will continue to go forward. A regulatory sandbox, a little bit up in the air at this point. But okay. that's the update. So that it so would that mean then that uh, relevant to our review, a proposed paraprofessional rule 5.4 um, that basically um, I mean 5.4 as it as it is written now um, would require a change in uh, RPC rule 5.4, I think. Yes, but that is part of the assumption. So it would have, to go, back, so have to go back to the professional, paraprofessional uh, work group in order to revise whatever they're suggesting with it. Yes, so the uh, standing up of a new licensee and the promulgation of paraprofessional rules of professional conduct uh, includes as part of the implementation process, conforming changes to other law, including the attorney rules of professional conduct. So uh, it's uh, pretty much on their to-do list that if this uh, implementation proceeds, that one of the components of the implementation plan is to uh, look at the uh, attorney rules of professional conduct and make all necessary conforming changes. And the uh, staff assisting the paraprofessional working group has been keeping a bit of a running list of what those uh, need to be, because you can't have a rule that allows, for example, fee sharing between paraprofessionals and lawyers that's authorized in paraprofessional RPCs, but strictly prohibited by attorney RPCs. That's well recognized. Right, that's why I'm asking. Okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> sure, good question, thanks. Um, I wanna point out, Justin, that the public comment deadline to submit this letter is, I believe, January 15th. Oh, January 12th, sorry, January 12th. And we don't meet again before that. So I understand. it's in five days. Right, so um, we're gonna need to vote this out or approval to circulate for public comment this letter subject to um, making revisions consistent with the discussion today. Yes. Agreed. Um, and so when, once, uh, we're done with comments here. I think that that's the next step. Um, so um, does anyone else have uh, further comments? So then um, I'll make a motion that um, for a vote to uh, approve um, COPRAC um, circulating, uh, or excuse me, COPRAC uh, submitting a um, letter to the California Paraprofessional Working Group um, providing uh, its input on the proposed rules. Um, and specifically, the letter that we've just discussed subject to um, edits um, to be made that are consistent with the discussion that we have had to, at today's meeting. Uh, I'll just rephrase that motion to approval of the letter for submission to the paraprofessional working group subject to making re revisions discussed and approved at the meeting today. Great. Great. Seconded. Sorry, who seconded that? I did. I can't, oh, sorry. I don't have my Zoom window up, so I can't. Oh, Bill? Oh, Bill, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Yep. Further discussion? 
Hearing none, I guess I'll take the vote. Uh, Justin Fields? Yes. Ken Bacon? Yes. Sarah Bonola? Yes. Elizabeth Bradley? Yes. Cassidy Chivers? Yes. Toby Inlander? Yes. Brandon Kruger? Yes. Joel Mark? Yes. Eleanor Mercado? Bill Munoz? Yes. Kyla Rowe? Yes. Hunter Starr? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. And uh, Justin, I will send you the meeting draft that following this meeting. Let's okay, great. I I'm thinking, subject to you having a, a better idea, which is very, very possible, Mimi, um, is uh, I've gotten some feedback, um, obviously, from this meeting and then some emails that I'll incorporate into what you're going to send me. Okay. And then I'm thinking, um, come you know Monday, uh, I'll, I'll incorporate whatever folks have sent me by then, okay. and then I will give you control of the document. And if anyone has further final edits, so that there's not multiple drafts floating around, that you, at that point on Monday you would have control and you could make the wordsmithing changes. Does that sure. approach work for you? That works for me. Okay, sounds good. Well, if, if anyone um, you know wants to send uh, me uh, some some edits. Uh, whether it's you know just typos or, or thoughts consistent with what we talked about today, um, I'll incorporate them through the weekend and then um, turn the the letter over to um, to Mimi on Monday, and then hopefully we'll have it finalized um, and ready to roll uh, for um, Mimi uh, by you know end of day Monday, so that she has time to uh, clean anything up and there's no fire drills on Wednesday. Yeah, I'll send it to you a little bit after the meeting. I have a bunch of typos and notes as well, but nothing substantive to add. Perfect. But take Let your time. Add that to this draft. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much. All right, really good discussion. Um, thanks, everybody. So next on our uh, agenda is discussion of um, what I call the memorandum about the special discipline case audit. And I think uh, if it makes sense to Randy or, or someone else on the, um, the State Bar staff to, to provide some um, background on this, uh, because I don't think that um, there's been discussion yet uh, amongst the committee members about the, the memo and, and the, um, the task to us. And then from there, um, you know, I can, I can offer some thoughts and then open up for discussion. Thank you, Justin. I'm happy to provide an introduction for this item. Uh, if you had a chance to review the staff memorandum, you know that this does come from a special group of the Board of Trustees. It is a specific assignment to Gilbrac. The Board of Trustees has conducted an extensive study with the goal of developing enhanced uh, proactive regulation of attorney trust accounting obligations. Uh, they submitted their report uh, to the full board in November that included the proposals to explore certain rule of professional conduct enhancements. Uh, the rules in particular are the trust accounting rule, rule 1.15, and the communication rule 1.4. Uh, the requests uh, center on strengthening uh, the obligations of lawyers with regard to their accountability for client funds with regard specifically to timely disbursement of funds, as well as communication with clients about the receipt of client funds. Uh, the goal is for uh, the board to receive the uh, technical assistance from COPRAC in preparing some draft rule language so that the board can issue it for public comment at their March meeting and to continue to explore um, these possible uh, rule changes. Uh, the recommendations of the group you know, some of them can be implemented per force of the board's action resolving to take that uh, approach. Uh, when it comes to changes to things like rules of professional conduct, uh, it involves further process. And that process is the development of actual proposed draft rule language, the circulation of the language for public comment, consideration of the public comment on the rule changes, possible uh, further revision and response to that public comment, and ultimately, uh, if the board continues to believe that this is uh, an appropriate enhancement to strengthen accountability on client trust accounting, the adoption of, by the board of those rule changes and then submission 
of those rule changes to the Supreme Court, who is the final arbiter, because an amendment to the rules of professional conduct will not become operative and binding on lawyers unless they are adopted by the board and approved by the Supreme Court. So the part in this uh, uh, spectrum of uh, regulatory activity that COPRAC has been assigned to assist on is the, is the technical expertise that you have in the rules of professional conduct, um, except when we're doing a comprehensive revision of the rules and we have an appointed rules revision commission, the board looks to COPRAC to be its expert on rule drafting for the rules of professional conduct. And while they have already essentially made the policy decision to explore enhancements of this type, they really do uh, uh, want uh, COPREC's assistance in developing the actual rule language for the proposal. And so this would, um, I would hope, entail taking uh, a look at some of these uh, possible changes to the rules today, and maybe if if it makes sense, uh, Mr. Chair, to have a drafting team to take it to the next step uh, before uh, your February meeting so that at your February meeting, you can actually vote on whatever language you feel is appropriate to assist the board in to continue studying these possible enhancements. Um, if I could call your attention to uh, attachment one of the memorandum. Attachment one consolidates a red line strikeout of the two rules um, that are essentially the discussion draft proposals that uh, were developed to try to capture uh, the concepts that were uh, considered and are being uh, handed off uh, to COPRAC uh, for development. And so I just want to walk through these because I think the most efficient use of time just to move immediately uh, to the actual rule text. And I'll, I'll give background on each aspect of the discussion drafts. And actually, Mimi, I think I want to start with uh, 1.15, if you don't mind. Great. Right. So this, of course, is the uh, trust accounting rule, I call it for short. Um, everything stays the same until you get to paragraph D. In paragraph D, subdivision one, uh, the concept that is, uh, of interest to the board that they believe will enhance, again, a, a lawyer accountability in the area of trust accounting is to refine the attorney's duty to notify a client or other person. And that phrase client or other person is a term of art. It refers to, of course, the client, but the other person uh, refers specifically to those folks to whom an attorney might owe a fiduciary duty or other duty that requires them to perform trust accounting obligations, uh, notice disbursement, et cetera, in favor of that person, albeit they are not a client. And those are things reflected in other comments to this rule and in case law. And so this particular uh, provision, D1, imposes the requirement to promptly notify a client or other person that funds uh, have been received. And so example, if you are uh, representing a, a plaintiff in civil litigation who's brought a claim for damages and the defendant's insurance company has distributed the funds and the lawyer has received those funds, then this rule requires the lawyer to inform the client properly of that fact. And what the board uh, committee was concerned about was that the term promptly was rather open-ended and ambiguous. And so the concept of adding more specific language uh, to facilitate compliance is really what is being explored here. And the discussion draft language that has been prepared adds the phrase, but in no event later than 14 days after receipt. And uh, this is to be distinguished from anything that applies to concepts of uh, distributing the funds. This is expressly and only the notice requirement. If you move down to paragraph D subdivision seven, that's the next amendment concept that is being uh, considered. And in this particular subdivision, this is the uh, distribution duty. It requires the lawyer to promptly distribute. And the current language says, as requested by the client or other person, any undisputed funds or property in the possession of the lawyer or law firm that the client or other person is entitled to receive. And there, there is case law 
for the proposition, I think it's in a footnote in the memo, which says that a client request or a request from a person who's otherwise a non-client but entitled to the distribution of the funds really does operate as an element to this rule. And so absent the request, the clock arguably does not start ticking on the lawyer's duty to promptly uh, distribute. And the concern of uh, the board committee uh, in this instance, in part was that they received input from a consultant who was retained to do nationwide research on trust accounting practices. And it was found by the consultant, essentially that California was the only jurisdiction that had a condition precedent uh, of a client request. Now, let me explain how, uh, you know, working with the Rules Commission over all the years, how I think uh, this language as by the client is intended to operate. We have just looked at in, in paragraph D1, an absolute requirement that a lawyer notify the client of receipt. And the as requested by the client language uh, in the current rules works in concert with that. So that if a lawyer dutifully gives notice soon to D1, then it's, it's pretty much anticipated that a self-interested client Mutually self-interested client. Again, my example of the plaintiff's attorney in civil litigation where the entire objective of that client was to obtain the monetary recovery for their civil damages claim. Uh, that if they're told, given notice that uh, funds have been received, that would, they would uh, very likely request prompt distribution. And so it wasn't that uh, the California rules as currently drafted um, are trying to uh, give um, you know, improper wiggle room, so to speak, to lawyers to not promptly to distribute, it was really intended to work in concert overall with the duties of the lawyer as a fiduciary, which include, of course, making sure the client understands that funds have been received and working with the client for the appropriate distribution. In removing that provision, they also wanted to focus on the word promptly in D7 and to augment that, well, what you have next, and it's on the same screen, is a brand new provision, uh, paragraph F. And what paragraph F essentially does is add a presumption affecting the burden of proof in the disciplinary proceeding, which contemplates that if funds are received, that absent a request from the client or the other person who's entitled to those funds, that the lawyer's failure to distribute those funds within 60 days of the receipt would constitute a presumed violation. Now, the concept of a presumed violation um, is something that is already uh, in the rules. There's precedent for it in the advertising rules. I believe that's mentioned also in a footnote to the memorandum, um, but this is not intended to be uh, a conclusive presumption. Um, it's intended to be a rebuttable presumption. And if you scroll down further, there is a new uh, comment four, and I'll call your attention to the very last sentence. Necessary and reasonable delays in resolving any such issues may serve as a basis for overcoming the presumption. And so there are a host of uh, events that can arise uh, after you receive funds on behalf of the client, that might affect your ability to promptly disperse. Those are part of the laundry list in this comment as well. Uh, there could be issues regarding medical liens, statutory liens, prior attorney's liens, disputes over costs and expenses, uh, disputes as to the attorney's fees themselves, issues from a bank's policies for clearing the funds. And all of these things, you know, theoretically could occur in, in, in one single case. And if that is the case, then that would be a basis for overcoming uh, the presumption. Again, the idea that uh, 60 days is an outside is really intended, again, from I think the board's goal to provide greater emphasis on the need for a lawyer to be diligent with regard to something that is of great importance to the client, the disbursement of their funds. Um, the other aspect of the uh, com comment is the actual listing of those things. Uh, and they're not intended to be exclusive. And so if there's other things that would 
uh, be characterized as necessary and reasonable delays, or if the client or other person themselves requests that funds uh, not be distributed within that time frame, all of those things would be factors taken into account uh, for applying this uh, presumption standard. And really that in a nutshell is uh, the concepts for revision uh, that the board has considered in regards to rule 1.15. If you scroll up Mimi, I'll quickly dispense with the rule 1.4 changes, which are uh, only in the comment. So the black letter standards of the communication rule uh, are not um, changed by this discussion draft or the concept that is being considered. It really is the addition of a comment and the comment really is intended to connect the dots between the explicit duty to notify a client about receipt of funds within 14 days and the fact that oftentimes the receipt of funds will constitute a significant development in the client's matter. Again, if you're representing a plaintiff with a civil damages claim, that's the objective of their employment of, of you. And, and it would be hard not to call that a, a significant development that would require prompt and reasonable uh, communication. Uh, but because this is the rule that's entitled communication with clients, it was felt that um, no one wants to hide the ball. If there are these explicit, particularly now more uh, aggressive uh, requirements with regard to notifying clients and communicating with them about receipt of funds, that you should have something in the comments to the rule entitled communication uh, that alerts lawyers to that. So again, the connecting the dots in the proposed added language to comment one is intended to uh, satisfy that uh, interest. Uh, but that is in a nutshell, the concepts for revision uh, that COPREC has been asked to assist the board in developing. Um, I did note that um, our, our friend, former COPREC member, David Carr provided uh, oral comment at the start of the meeting. Uh, he was concerned about um, the uh, presumption requirement, but I noted that he referred to it as conclusive and it is in no wise intended to be a conclusive presumption. Um, the language in the last sentence of comment four that you can overcome the presumption um, is there for that purpose, but uh, the discussion draft is really a starting point for COPRAC and it would be perfectly reasonable if uh, COPRAC were to consider just as an example, adding the word rebuttable, either in the black letter language of paragraph F or in the comment first line of, of the comment four uh, to make it unmistakable that it is a rebuttable presumption. Now, you know, there are cases pursuant to uh, evidence code section 605 and 606 that basically say that that statutory definition of presumptions shifting the burden of proof are in fact rebuttable. And there is at least one uh, state bar court review department case where the former one of the former advertising presumptions were litigated and it was treated by the hearing department and review department as rebuttable. So I, I don't think there's too much uh, disclarity on the rebuttable nature of this presumption, but that shouldn't stop you from making it crystal clear by adding the word uh, rebuttable if you want to. Again, this is a starting point for you to help the board crystallize the concept so that the board can further consider it. And I'll end with this last point, which is, um, this is a rule, it will go out for public comment, you're being asked to provide your expertise in helping draft it, but if COPRAC, um, you know, questions the, the wisdom of the policy, if COPRAC has a completely different approach that might achieve the same goal of strengthening accountability, then I would say COPRAC should absolutely raise that during the public comment process on these proposed changes, because that would be the place for the board to take that into account together with all of the other feedback so that they can make an informed policy decision if they wanna go forward with this. Um, what they are looking for now for the narrow exercise is their drafting expertise, but uh, it's not intended to uh, uh, exclude or shut off your ability to, to say anything else you might think the board would find helpful as part of that uh, later public comment process. And that's all I have. Thank you, Randy. Uh, that was uh, very articulate and clear and helpful.
and detailed. So I think everyone appreciates um, the time that, that went into preparing that explanation for us. Um, so just procedurally, um, what, what I, at least um, in speaking with Dina and Sarah, we envisioned is um, opening the floor to discussion today for the committee as a whole. And then um, in advance of our February meeting. And today, hopefully um, getting some volunteers who with the benefit of initial um, thoughts from the committee as a whole could um, look more closely at the uh, memo and these proposed revisions and then be prepared to um, bring to the um, meeting on February um, their further revisions, edits, thoughts, et cetera, for um, further discussion. I think that's consistent with what Rand, Randy, you were um, proposing. Um, but before we open the floor, I, I, I have a few questions, um, if anyone else does for Randy, and sorry, Pepper, you here, but I just wanna make sure everyone's on the same page about this. Um, one is in terms of timing. Um, what, you know, certainly we can, we can um, have a, a group, uh, hopefully volunteer at today's meeting and have a discussion of um, whatever further wordsmithing they do at the February meeting. But when is, when is the uh, board expecting some kind of work product from us? So the board will be taking this up, uh, they're hoping at their March 24th and 25th meeting. So if you take it on at your uh, February meeting, and uh, you know we have a work product in hand soon after that, uh, staff can certainly package it in, in the manner needed for the board to uh, review it and, and put it out for, for a public copy period. And so uh, having something voted out at your February meeting will be timely. Okay, so just, okay. Uh, when's the board's, do you know when the board's next meeting is after their March meeting? Uh, they will be having a meeting on May 19th and 20th, I believe. Okay. Um, I mean, certainly we can endeavor for the, for the March um, to get something to them by the March meeting. But um, well, I, without knowing the, the committee's thoughts on the, the rules and the extent of wordsmithing that might be necessary, that's the only reason I ask. But I, I appreciate that they're looking for something um, from us for the March sure. meeting. Um, we can cross the bridge if that for some reason is not feasible, but hopefully it will be. Um, I noticed in the memo, uh, and maybe it was just the wording, it suggested that um, COPRAC would be providing input on revisions to the proposed um, 1.15, but that the staff would be, was directed to clarify rule 1.4, but is it right that we'll, we'll be able to offer input on both rules? Yes, I, I have uh, worked with um, uh, representatives of the Office of Chief Trial Counsel in developing the discussion draft language. And um, yes, the board's uh, report actually bifurcates that, but because these topics are intertwined, it, it didn't make too much sense to me <laughs> to have uh, you know the work uh, on the one proposal for 1.4 be hermetically sealed off from what's going on on the COPRAC side of things. They're, they're referring back to each other in the language of the amendments themselves. So uh, welcoming COPRAC's work on the 1.4 issue, um, I think makes, uh, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then, um, you know, again, on the subject of work product, uh, you know, you mentioned public comments. Um, COPRAC could offer thoughts there, but if we are to, for some reason, um, well, regardless of what our edits are um, to these proposals here, um, you know, I'm wondering what is the appropriate work product for us to be presenting to the board? You know, for instance, if, if we make material changes um, to any of these um, proposed um, revisions, is the state bar, excuse me, the board of trustees looking to us or would they like from us some kind of short explanation as to why we've made changes or do they literally just want, 
you know, a red line version of the rule from us? Do they want some kind of explanation on top of that for purposes of what they're doing at the March meeting? Oh, sure. An explanation is, is always helpful. Um, it is not simply the red line strikeout, the explanation, um, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be extensive um, uh, because uh, you know, it's reflected in the memo and in, in the much more uh, lengthy uh, board report. Um, you know, their consideration of their policy objectives have been relatively laid out. And so the COPRAC explanation of the actual language uh, you know, developed you know, from a technical standpoint would just explain how that language um, really carries forward uh, those policy objectives. Okay. Because I can, that, that's helpful, because I can see a, a scenario where, you know, we might tweak um, the, the red lines in, in the memo here, the additions, and, and want to offer our thoughts as to why we've made those um, or proposed changes so that that informs the, the Board of Trustees consideration. Oh, absolutely. So that's helpful. I mean, you know, I tried to convey that the, the board has formed COPRAC as a standing committee to be its resident expert. And, you know, of course, the explanations and, and guidance from the expert is, is always welcome. Great. And then um, you mentioned that a consultant was retained and offered feedback that California was the only jurisdiction that had this condition precedent about a client's request. Um, and, you know, maybe this is in the full report, which I apologize, I haven't read every page. Um, but it, it, is that in there a uh, reference to, to that um, work that the consultant did, or is there any publicly available information that um, we would have access to that, that would provide information about what that consultant concluded with respect to what other jurisdictions are doing? Uh, I'm not sure if it actually made it into the final report. It was uh, discussed at one of the meetings that I attended, and I'm pretty sure I can track down the consultant's memorandum and have that sent out to everybody. Yeah, that'd be terrific. I think it's a it might be a helpful data point um, sure. as we're as we're looking at the context for these um, revisions. So that would be terrific. Um, okay, those are the questions that I wanted to pepper you with. Thank you. <laughs> um, no does problem. anyone else have questions for um, for Randall before we um, get into the the substance here? Okay. Um, so like I said, um, and, and one of the reasons we highlighted uh, this memo in the, uh, for the agenda materials today is to, to try to have a discussion with the group as a whole and give hopefully feedback um, for those who might volunteer to look at this more closely between now and the February meeting. Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> I have some thoughts uh, on, on, on these, um, proposed changes and, um, you know, happy to offer them, but I'd really prefer to open it up to the committee as a whole and, and hear what folks um, think about uh, these, um, what's being proposed here. Justin, uh, I, I'd like to share first a, um, a unique uh, perspective that doesn't make it a good perspective, but at least a unique one generally. And then I've got some specific comments um, I, the whole, this whole thing comes out of, of the Girardi situation and the unique perspective I gained on that was as a special deputy trial counsel, I handled three of the Girardi complaints. And, um, as I've already discussed with certain people at the bar, um, the problem there was is that Girardi is a unique situation. He's a one-off. He's a one-off because there is only one Girardi. I'll, I'll just about guarantee that. But more than that, he insinuated himself um, with a closeness to certain state bar officials, which then required that all of the disciplinary matters be referred to special deputy trial counsel. And the way the special deputy trial counsel um, worked um, there was about 20 of us, and we all got one here, one there. I had three over the course of about five years, and none of us really saw the whole picture. So therefore, 
I don't think any of us focused in on the fact that in addition to the complaints that were being made, which is that Girardi wasn't giving them the money that they were owed, both clients and co-counsel, um, none of us realized that there might be a trust account issue involved. Now, the special deputy issue has been addressed by the recent uh, amendments to uh, State Bar Rule 2201 uh, to appoint or to increase the scope of the special deputy uh, trial counsel administrator um, to uh, better obtain and communicate with the rest of the special deputies, the whole picture. But looking at these rules against that perspective, I'm really concerned that we might be over-regulating this issue unnecessarily. And there are several things that, that stick out of my mind uh, as to why we might doing that. And the first, and I apologize, by the way, I only got to look at this um, early this morning. And so more work needs to be done. I'm glad we're gonna have time to do it. But the first thing is about the presumption. Um, if you'll recall that in what was it, April of 2018, everybody had to get re-fingerprinted. And so the state bar went back and they uh, hauled up about, I don't know how many hundreds of attorneys who had had some ancient conviction to prove that it was not moral turpitude. They had to hire bar counsel to deal with it. They had to um, um, straighten all that out. They had to get their record expunged when it was found that it was not moral turpitude. And since there's so many ways that this presumption, as you pointed out, or I guess as Randall pointed out, um, can be overcome, are we going to be putting all the attorneys who have really good reasons for why they handle their trust accounts the way they handle them, going to have to go and face charges or face investigation from the state bar. And that's never a pleasant thought, um, particularly when um, your you know, most attorney's goal is to try and accommodate the needs of the client with these presumptions. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, um, you know, funds for third parties, disputes, escrows uh, that they hold in their trust accounts. Um, uh, you know, tax deferrals, the client might not want it uh, in a certain year. I can't comment on the legality of that because it is the client's money and obviously it's taxable in the year received, but there's, you occasionally get those requests. So, you know, it comes in on December 25th and you say, well, wait, distribute it on January 1st. It's better tax year for me and things like that. Um, so, and I think that David Carr's comments about overreaching, even though he might have misstated um, whether it was rebuttable or not, um, knowing David and knowing his, him from the participation in the APRL, um, he's not alone in that thinking in terms of what burden are we placing on attorneys overall for the the dastardly acts of one horrible actor. And um, I think a lot of this has to be thought through more. Um, uh, so that those are my thoughts. And I, I just would like to have us all keep that in mind from the overall big picture perspective, as opposed to just looking at these rules as we go forward. Yeah. I agree with Joel. I, I mean, that that's, I think that hits it, the nail on the head. I mean, the presumption it, it is, um, there's a presumption of a violation if the money isn't distributed um, within 60 days. So that means, you know, and it's to promote diligence to resolve disputes and whatever else. But what if that dispute isn't resolved within 60 days? I mean, I typically advise clients that, you know, if, if, if you can't resolve the dispute, you can't hold the money indefinitely, you have to interplead it, you know, you have to have a judge decide the dispute. So what happens in that scenario where, you know, the six days are up and you, you have 
you have been diligent, but it's not, you know, the dispute isn't resolved. Um, and so, and, and I do, I, I think that it puts a, a, an undue burden on the lawyers who, you know, for the most part are typically diligent in handling these types of issues, but they're, you know, it can be confusing as to when to distribute and to who's entitled to the money and whether or not there's a dispute. So I think this just place, places um, more burden on the lawyer unnecessarily. Um, so I agree with Joel. I, I don't think it should be scrapped altogether. Some of these revisions um, are good. Um, but, um, you know, I like the 14 day notification um, um, provision, but the presum I, I agree. I think the presumption is dangerous. I think uh, one of the things that, um, one of the things I think about that D7, um, related to this point about you, when you have undisputed funds or disputed funds is that in D7, the language is undisputed, that you have to distribute undisputed funds. And then the revisions that have been drafted don't really, don't really um, carry through the word undisputed. So I think that's one of the things that I think creates a problem that I think we should help clarify, which is just, you know, there's ethics opinions and case law on the fact that, like you said, Cassidy, you have undisputed funds, those are held or excuse me, undisputed funds should be distributed, disputed funds should be held. And so if we can better capture, I think, the concept of what are we talking about with disputed and undisputed funds so that there's not this sense of like, oh, you have to resolve all disputes within 60 days, which I think is unworkable and problematic. So I have that point, which I think is something we should explore and really making sure we track that undisputed part and making clear that, and that could be in a comment or something. And then the other issue I, have concerns about with respect to D7 is that we have sort of the lumping together of funds and property. And as we know from our client file retention is that property, that client files are also considered property. And a lot of the trust account, you know, this rule has sort of in, in some places combines the concept of returning funds and property to clients. And of course, if a client asks for property to be returned to, you know, I think we don't want to upset that concept of a client asking for a file to be returned as property versus what we're really getting at is settlement funds, right? You get settlement funds from a client and then they need to be notified and then they need to be promptly distributed with respect to things that are not disputed and not. So I, I, you know, I think that concept can be strengthened through some of this, but I have concerns about the, you know, making sure we're clear about what's disputed and undisputed and obligations related to that. And then the second point, which is like not including property in that, not saying every time that the client has an obligation under these rules or the attorney, excuse me, to distribute the client file because that's property or could be interpreted as property and and so those are some of the concerns i have about some of these revisions which i think we can explore further um well along with other comments that people have you know yeah i i agree with you dina and that, that was something that created a little bit of confusion for me when i was looking at the um, proposed revisions um to comment four and comparing it to the language of of a, D7, um, to me, it was saying you could rebut the presumption by showing, you know, if there were issues to resolve an outstanding medical lien or, or other issues. But to me, then that's not really undisputed funds to which the client is entitled. So, but the comment was implying that you could be, have a presumed violation in that situation. So kind of just looking at comment four in conjunction with 1.15 D7, I just, it created confusion for me when I was reviewing it. And so I think that could be clarified. And I, I view the 60 day rebuttable presumption as, you know, there's not really, I feel a one size fits all um, given the issues that are discussed in the comment four. And so I, I question whether another potential way, if we really want the lawyers to act promptly to resolve any issues with disputed funds, that maybe that could be added potentially to the, to the rule a duty to act promptly with that. But uh, trying to prescribe a period of time, it just seems like it is problematic for, for the reasons that you know others have already mentioned, so. I, yeah, I agree with all that. I had a question too on the notice one in D1. The, I, I don't have a problem with the 14 days to the client, but it says, or other person. So in a personal injury case, I mean, I know my firm, we've had, you know, you can have, you know, 
more than a dozen, you know, potential lien claimants. And, and sometimes you may not have had any communication with them for a while. So having to provide notification, and it's also unclear on this, whether it's written or oral, but uh, uh, within 14 days to someone other than the client with whom you have your direct communication um, could be a hefty burden. Well, also, Ken, just if I may add, there's, uh, you know, sometimes it's say a medical lien that's now part of the funds that are part of the trust account. Sometimes those those liens go away, and the client's not going to be happy when you go and notify and wake up the claimant. Um, that's a conflict of some kind, and so there, there, I haven't even thought through all the possible scenarios like that, but they're there. My, my only thought on this is that, you know, this would be easy to comply with in my practice arena, but there's so many different practice arenas that I am worried this is creating uh, potential presumptive violations where people are doing everything right. And then I really, based upon my limited understanding of the Girardi situation that seems to have, you know, uh, brought a lot of attention to this, I don't see how any of these revisions would apply to what he was up to, would stop the sort of behavior that we've seen in a couple of really egregious instances. It's just very, um, it's somewhat a field of, of what would actually have made a difference to the clients that were entering this. Ken, you're right. Girardi was violating the existing rules. Yeah, I, I mean, you know. He's, I, I do, I agree with, I, I do sort of, I've heard anecdotally um, that this isn't, I mean, this is obviously, he's an example of horrible behavior, but this sort of practice with trust funds and abuse of trust funds is not unique to him. Um, yes. And I think that there are practices with, that have come out in other states with other attorneys where, you know, you get these funds and you tell clients if they're minors, like, oh, I'll manage the funds for you. And they dribble it out, you know, over time to people. And there are some, you know, these may be, you know, the outlier cases, but I, and I don't know that this rule is, like you said, if somebody's, you know, inclined to violate rules, they're going to violate all the rules. But the, um, you know, the concept that a client's undisputed settlement fund shouldn't promptly be distributed to the client, and we're not talking about, we could specify the things that we're not talking about. I don't know that that is, um, that should be controversial, right? Actually, so, you know, I totally agree with you on that, and, and really have always been looking for clarification of what prompt distribution of undisputed funds is, because I've had a lot of attorneys take really unreasonable positions, in my view, on that issue. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you on that. I, I am just worried about the the time frames, or maybe yeah. we clean it up with the definition of what undisputed means. You know? Yeah, I don't know how the sixty days. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think we want to explore those concepts further, and certainly the way it's drafted. But, um, and I don't know that this rule would have protected or prevented any of the things that happened. You know, I, I agree with that observation. Uh, I do know that there are other people, other attorneys, unfortunately, that um, you know have a sort of a more cavalier attitude towards trust funds and distribution of clients and misuse that process. Um, and you know how we go about whether it's through these rules or whether there needs you know other protections that need to be in place for 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 plaintiffs. You know, I don't I don't know all the answers to that, but I don't think it is that particular issue is unique to this person. So I will just say that. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, I don't think it's unique to this person at all, although this was egregious beyond egregious. Um, and I do think that the rule as it's currently written is way too vague to be as protective as it should be uh, for the client. So um, I just want to say that. I think it needs to be reworked given all of the issues that, that have been raised here, but um, I do think it needs to be reworked a bit. Yeah, uh, Brandon, you didn't you have a situation with something like um, the fee, the, the recovery in a personal injury case 
the fee amount is undisputed. The recovery to the client is undisputed. There's a fee split agreement that the client had signed off on and all was good about that. And now the two lawyers aren't disputing it. So the lawyer is going to distribute and the client says, I hate that lawyer, don't distribute. Is that disputed? You know, yeah, I've seen some I've seen some shades of gray on it that are somewhat unusual, you know, but but yes, there are but 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 there are plenty of attorneys like the run of the mill issue that comes to me is attorneys that have a dispute and um, grossly overestimate what would be the uh, the area in dispute of the funds so that the client just gets a trickle and it's sort of a hostage situation. And, and we see that with some frequency, you know, um, I'm not sure. I think the rule, a rule could help. I don't know uh, if it's going to stop behavior like that, but it, it's certainly a good idea. I mean, I, I would, I think there are conscientious practitioners that might, um, that a rule like this might actually help, help them behave better. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not opposed to a rule. And the one thing I liked was the 14 day notice. It's like, uh, what if you notify somebody who, might not otherwise request it, but I, I just think a lot of thought has to go into this so that the the um, the solution for the one or two bad actors or three bad actors um, doesn't bring all the good people into it with a rebuttable presumption that they have to worry about because somewhere down the road, if somebody mentions to the state bar, it's been more than 60 days since the money came in. Well, what does that mean? Does the state bar open up a, a, an investigation um, and say, okay, counsel rebut this uh, presumption and then you're, the burden of proof is on you. And so I, I just got to think through this stuff and particularly, okay, Girardi is not the only one, but there, He's certainly not the run of the mill attorney either. So, anyway. was Girardi set? Was that settlement funds that he was taking, or I'm not that familiar? A lot of it was huge amounts of it was. Oh, was. And a lot of it. The the one of the complaints I handled was a co-counsel that supposedly was to get. Uh, there was a court order that. But was he, he was, was also just this big recovery from a, a class action and he didn't get any money. Yeah, he was also just um, sort of Ponzi scheming. So for instance, I sued, I sued his firm for malpractice and settled. He always represented himself. So there was no insurance company to ever see what was happening, right? And uh, so his own attorneys would represent and then they would settle. And what none of us who ever resolved claims with him knew was what is revealed now is that those settlement funds were just probably client funds from other recoveries. And he was just getting farther and farther. So he was, his situation's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully a one-off, but you know, I just, you know, he's not gonna, guys like that are not gonna be stopped by these rules. Um, I think his unique situation was the way in which the state bar had to go to the special deputy program to investigate, which is very different than the internal investigation. Part, part of the reason I asked is, I mean, at least with settlement funds, when you're dealing with insurers, I mean, there's already a statutory obligation for the insurers to provide yeah. notice when they send the funds. Girardi's firm always represented itself with Girardi counsel, and there was never an insurance company to see what was happening. Oh, okay. Which is, I guess, an effective way to keep doing something terrible for a really long time. I always assume that uh, insurance code or that section about the insurance settlements was probably stemmed from, you know, lawyers not notifying their clients that they got settlement funds then, but, but yeah. there is that obligation already. Yeah. If I may, um, it seems that everybody is kind of focusing on this 60 day presumption as potentially problematic, what would be, or if it's our place, what would be our proposed solution to that problem? Would it be um, a, a comment that suggests 60 days as a best practice, which is almost a taboo phrase around here? Um, what, what would be the solution to that? 
my 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 thinking is that I don't I can't imagine there's a problem with the 60 days if we have clarity as to what the uh, what it means in undisputed client funds, you know, as to what that means to be undisputed client funds. Because if it's truly undisputed, why would any attorney need that much time to to distribute it? So I'm not sure that that's the problem as I see it. We have we have a Coprac opinion. Uh, I think it's around 2007 or I don't know, which dealt with um, whether or not you can hold disputed funds in a trust account. And there's language in there about, yes, you can, provided you initiate the dispute resolution as soon as practical, I think is the, the language. And I think that it's a lot closer to protecting both sides than a 60 day rebuttable presumption does. And so we've used that language before. So um, that's just a thought. I see Randall has his hand up. Sure. Um, thanks, Justin. If you want to tinker with the concept of you know, what is the real trigger here for the 60 days and then you want to create a term of art for purposes of the presumption, then you could add a subparagraph that is the definition of quote unquote disputed funds uh, and use that uh, to essentially collect. And you could even say it includes, but is not limited to all of the things that typically occur so that the 60 day standard really is intended uh, to drive uh, the promptness of distribution of undisputed funds. I think that's fine. And if you wanted to also uh, remove from the ambit of the presumption, the distribution of client property or more narrow than that, client property in the form of a client uh, files or, or papers that constitute the client file, uh, then that I think would also still be consistent with the board's request for your help. All of those things are great ideas and I think you know, uh, if you want to implement any of those things, I think it would be would be helpful. Yeah, just to echo um, <clears throat> what Randall said, and uh, hearing the comments so far um, from the committee, um, I you know, I, I have the same uh, reaction to the um, proposed language. For um, 115 and 124, that um, in concept, making these changes um, could be helpful. But um, you know, what resonated for me, uh, especially, is hearing Brandon's point that um, there's a spectrum of practices, and uh, we want to make sure that we're um, offering feedback in, in a proposed rule that is not going to unnecessarily. Um, make lawyers susceptible to rule violations in, in a way that's unintended, um, but, but it's going to drive home the, the purpose of these changes and not necessarily be overreactive in a way that isn't helpful um, to uh, clients and, and certainly not to the lawyers uh, who represent them. And so it, it, you know, it sounds to me like we have some, um, some editing to do and that we want to do to try and um, maybe um, focus the uh, proposed changes in a way that the committee is more comfortable with and address the concerns that have been expressed um, today. Um, so I, I see this uh, uh, exercise that the, the volunteers are going to do between now and February is a very important one. It probably um, will take some work, um, but it seems like this is a time sensitive task, but we also want to get it right and um, want to get on the same page about what, what are uh, proposed changes that this committee um, is comfortable with. And so I, 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 I'm glad we're having this conversation now and we should continue it and anticipate in February, we're also going to have a very uh, meaningful discussion um, so, um, wh what other, uh, what other comments or thoughts do people have that they want to raise, um, 
particularly if there's language or um, concepts in these proposed changes that we haven't already discussed, um, but that, that it would be worth flagging um, for consideration of the um, committee. The, uh, I, I mentioned it briefly when I was speaking earlier in D1, where it says promptly notify. Once again, it, it doesn't say how, oral, written. Um, so that's kind of an ambiguity. I think they should probably clean up how that notification should occur. Another, another comment that I have, and this may be for the draft part of it, is the whole notion of the presumption in the, whether it's rebuttable or otherwise. I'm just looking through the rule. There's no other rule that sets forth any type of presumption, whether or not it's a violation or not. For instance, if you send a, you don't, you don't send a written settlement agreement or a settlement uh, offer to your client, it says you promptly must transmit a written settlement offer to Client. That would be another. If you don't do that, is that a presumed violation? I mean, you know, it just it seems to me this really gets back to Joel's comment. It's like this one bad actor, uh, and there, there are other people that seem far from us all the time about that, but it seems like that was really the premise with just the notion of putting uh, presumption in one rule. That requires us to notify a client when we get the funds. Are we now going to start changing all the other rules to now put presumption in all the other rules that require written communications or things we have to do with the clients? Are we, are, are we going to have to put a burden of proof in each of those rules? Well, uh, I think this opens and board box, quite honestly. Uh, and I, and I see that, and I assume this is only for purposes of discipline, which can maybe another drafting issue in here, that it's got to specifically identify this is the burden of proof in a disciplinary proceeding. Because other people can see that as well. But now, in a civil case, all those rules specifically say you can't use evidence of a violation as evidence of malpractice standing alone. It would be part of other evidence, yes. But I think this just creates a slippery slope when you're talking about the person in just one group and not in the other group. It's either all of them or none of them. Right on. Bill, I was having some trouble hearing you. I think it's just the audio a little bit, but. Oh, I'm sorry. I was covering up my. my uh, what it sounded like you were just. What it sounded like you were discussing um, with regard to presumptions. The only, the only other place that I remember seeing presumptions specifically linked to certain number of days was I think in like the sale of law firms. And that isn't presumptions that would be um, uh, interpreted against an attorney. So I, I think that the, your comment is well taken with regard to that. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, it, it makes me very nervous having a presumption that would be construed against an attorney um, like this, but I, I think that providing, providing definite, you know, ballpark estimates of the amount of time something should take in the view of people who do this, um, or, or who think, you know, that this is the way it should be done if there's no dispute. I think that that could be very useful to attorneys. So I, I think there is some, some common ground there. Um, let me make a comment about it. I, I think what Bill and Hunter are touching on is important, which is that, uh, you know, this is these, these proposed changes are admittedly um, reactive to what um, Mr. Girardi did. Um, and so I think as we're considering what is an appropriate change, we need to keep in mind um, whether these proposed changes are consistent with other rules. Do other, for instance, do other rules have presumptions? In what context do they have presumptions? What other rules have timeframe prescriptions? In what context do they have timeframe prescriptions or do they not? So that in what we are drafting is um, not going to be an anomaly with the overall framework of the professional conduct rules, because memory serves me, words like 
reasonable and promptly. We're, we're, we're def, you know, placed in the rules in part not to be overly specific, right? To give some wiggle room. And does that create some vagueness? Sure, it does. Um, so if we're going to be adding pres prescriptions that aren't in other rules, um, I think we have to be mindful of, okay, well, how do we avoid this being anomalous or potentially um, a landmine? For, for lawyers. And, you know, there's been discussion about the 60 days. We haven't um, talked as much about the 14 day um, provision, which I think it has to do with giving notice about funds coming in. And, you know, again, I don't know, and, and we'll have to, and I'll have to look at the, uh, the report more, more, more carefully, but I think of the sole practitioner who is lucky enough to take a two week vacation with her family. Often, you know, some COVID-free zone on a beach. That sounds amazing. And and they come back on day 15 and they haven't notified the client that funds have come in. Is that really a rule violation? Is that what we intend here? I, I can't imagine. And so again, you know, kind of going back to Brandon's comment, I think we need to look at the spectrum of, of lawyers and practices and how these rules could play out in the real world and whether we're comfortable with. Um, these prescriptions that are um, being proposed. And if we're not, how do we either soften them or revise them so they're going to be applicable in a way that is protective of clients, but not creating traps for the uh, and it's, For me, that's one of the big picture um, concerns, if you will, that I have is that, that, that I want us to, to keep in mind as yeah. we work on uh, editing these, um, these drafts. Justin, I, I, I'm just looking at the first paragraph of the memo that kicked all this off. And it says the special committee of the board, the committee on special discipline audit case to further analyze the audit report on closed discipline cases against Thomas Girardi. And that's a worthwhile thing for the, the bar to do. I think they had a lot inside their own internal house um, to look at. And they have looked at it, but I don't want to see us or a rule adopted with that mentality that because one attorney did these things, um, we're all going to have to do something else. I think if we're going to look at these rules and analyze them over the next month and, and, and think about them, I think we ought to think about them outside of any consideration of Girardi. Are these good for the attorneys? Are these good for the clients? Are these good for the profession? Having nothing to do with Thomas Girardi. That's, that's absolutely uh, right in my view. And I think that's one of the reasons that the board was um, frankly smart to, um, to seek our input because we don't have that history with the Girardi. Well, you do, but the rest of us don't have any history with um, the Girardi situation. And so we can look at these with a different set of eyes and hopefully provide feedback that's going to um, not just create an anomaly, but rather rules that are going to actually be beneficial for a purpose that goes beyond just one lawyer. And so I think uh, your, your comment is right. And it's a mindset that we want to have as we go through these um, proposed changes and think about what further revisions we wanna make. Because certainly the purpose and the intent behind these changes, I think we can all understand, but it's a matter of, you know, what is the language gonna be? What is it gonna mean for lawyers and how could it potentially be implemented in a way that's unintended? These are all the considerations um, that we have to have in mind. And, um, you know, I, it's a big task. Frankly, this is not a simple wordsmithing thing, given all the comments that we've had, and we're going to have to give some critical thought um, to this. Um, you know, I, I don't want to close keep thoughts and comments on this, but I do I see it's 320. Um, and so, as, at least as an initial matter, I want to make sure we have a group of folks who have volunteered to look at the um, proposed changes and to come up with um, some wordsmithing um, for the February meeting. So um, who, who would be willing to volunteer to be part of that group? I see Joel and Bill 
uh, I, sorry, with my uh, Zoom, that's all I can see. Is there anyone else besides Joel and Bill? Yeah, I, Sarah as well. And, and Toby. Toby. I had one uh, quick question as well after, um, for, um, for Randall, just if, if I can raise that when, when there's the right time. Yeah, let, let's just get this uh, group down and then absolutely. Um, anyone else want to volunteer at this time? And if you want to think about it, look at your schedules. I understand, just send me an email. But right now we got Joel, Bill, Sarah, and Toby. Okay. And, and just for that group, you know, the way I, it, Sarah has uh, started a, a wave, which I, as I've said, I hope continues, wherein when we make changes to things, um, more so when there's public comments, but I think here as well, to have some kind of document that explains the purpose behind the changes. And so if there's time to do something like that, you know, if a, if a significant change is made, to have a document um, that explains why, both for our internal purposes and discussion in February, but also as sort of the template for whatever communication we're gonna to give to the Board of Trustees, explaining why we've made certain changes. I think simultaneously with making the edits to the proposed um, changes, it would be helpful to start that document um, for the reason I just described, if that makes sense. Um, and um, with that, Sarah, please, um, by all means, uh, ask your question. You're on mute, Sarah. Sorry, I wanted to know, Randolph, if there was any consideration given to um, this rebuttable presumption idea and any potential constitutional issues relating to it. I know, and you know, obviously in criminal matters there would be, but sometimes in quasi-criminal or situations where substantial property rights are at stake, there could be constitutional issues. So I didn't know if there was any analysis yet on that aspect. I'm not aware of that occurring with the special discipline audit committee, but the Rules Revision Commission uh, did consider the issue of the presumptions affecting the burden of proof in a disciplinary proceeding in connection with the existing authority granted by the Supreme Court in connection with the advertising rules. Okay. And it was determined that it, it was enforceable. They did in part look at the cases that uh, had applied them and I do recall that we did get um, some input when the commission at one point had considered um, essentially um, deleting the board's authority to adopt presumptions with respect to advertising violations. And we received public comment back indicating that uh, because the standard for improper advertising is essentially a constitutional standard, false, deceptive, misleading, or confusing central Hudson test, that um, if a rule were only to say that, uh, then it really wouldn't be all that helpful to either those who must comply or those who are wondering if there's been a violation. And specific comments we got back included comments from the Office of Trial Counsel that said that uh, presumptions when you're dealing with something like advertising uh, have benefit beyond the effect in the disciplinary proceeding. They educate uh, the public as to a, a topic that might be obtuse uh, for the public. They give lawyers guidance as to the parameters of when they're within compliance. And with respect to uh, complaints, they allow intake staff uh, to intelligently assess and even close things um, because of the specific guidance the more detailed uh, uh, addressing of things that might otherwise require you to delve into case law or other authorities just to wrap your head around whether or not something is or is not, in the case of advertising, false, deceptive, misleading, confusing, et cetera. And I think part of the reason why the presumption approach is being considered for the trust accounting rules is because promptly in, in, in the context of the trust accounting rules, resonates the same way with, with some folks. They feel like um, neither the public nor the lawyers, nor maybe even intake staff in handling complaints have a ready opportunity to assess what that means. And if everything is a one-off case-by-case -case consideration, 
that's not efficient, doesn't breed consistency for anybody, but a presumption that gives you more detail, which was the case with the advertising presumptions, has that saline effect. Again, beyond what it does ultimately with regard to whether someone is found culpable of anything. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, let me just offer two other comments um, while they're fresh in my mind for the um, our subgroup here and, and then everyone else. Um, one is that I think it will be important in deciding how this rule might be changed to look at how it is we got to the rule that we have. And so, you know, for instance, there's case law cited in the um, There's the executive summary from the rule changes in 2018 and get a sense of whether the changes that are being proposed um, are so inconsistent, so untenable relative to the purpose of the language that's being changed that we need to call that out. Or whether we can marry the, the purpose of the rule and the language that we're considering changing um, based on the, the, what's described in the case law and executive summaries and so on with what we'd like to propose in, in uh, whatever iteration we present to the Board of Trustees. I think we need to look back in order to look forward is what I'm saying. So I think it would be helpful if um, the, the subgroup um, took a look at, back at the, at the case law and interpretation of, um, of the provisions that are being changed. And then the second comment I would make um, is that at least, you know, when I, when I look at these proposed rules, um, one thing that I try to do, uh, maybe not as well as others, is look at um, what I would consider like the hot legalese, the hot words that you see in statutes and cases like reasonable uh, and, and words that are kind of mushy. And whether they, you know, when you look at them in context, whether it makes sense for the purpose that that, that word's being used. So to give you an example, uh, one thing that stood out to me at least was the proposed comment four, so 115, which uses the phrase necessary and reasonable delays. Necessary and reasonable was the word, the, the phrase that caught my attention um, with respect to resolving issues. Well, there could be uh, delays that are neither reasonable nor necessary that cause delays that are completely outside of the control of the lawyer, that are unavoidable. And so I don't think that that formulation fairly captures the many the myriad circumstances that could arise where it really would be unfair to tag the lawyer with a presumption, right? I don't think that that necessary and reasonable is the right formulation. So I think that we need to really think about when we see these types of words, um, whether, they, whether they are broad enough uh, to address the issue or whether they, again, are gonna be a trap for them. Right? So I just offer that as one example of some of the diction I saw um, that, that we, I think we need to think really critically about and whether it's the right formulation. Um, with that, I, I, you know, I, I've offered a, a lot of thoughts um, and so I'll be quiet. Um, do other folks have additional comments that they wanna to provide to the committee and, and this, the subgroup before we move to our um, next topic. Okay. Um, what I would also say is that, you know, this is such an important issue, these changes, and I think we all take rule revision very seriously. And, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly going to endeavor to have this done for the um, Board of Trustees for their March meeting. And to sort of expedite that, I would say that if um, if you have additional comments, um, please do send them um, to um, to me and Sarah, so that the subgroup can have the benefit of your thoughts before the February meeting. Uh, I think we want to give them as much ammo as possible to make um, the best um, proposed edits that they can in, in the time frame that we have trying to be mindful of when the Board of Trustees is looking for our um, feedback. Um, and with that, is there, is there anything else that um, either Randall or any members want to discuss 
about um, this um, rule revision? Well, I can provide the drafting team if they're looking for background materials on what the commission was thinking when they drafted the rule, I can provide them the report and recommendation that went to the Supreme Court. I'll circulate that to them. Great. If you wouldn't mind copying me, I'd love to see that. I know there, I think there was a link um, somewhere, but it'd be helpful to have it top of inbox. Yeah, well, for the um, on the website, it's usually just the executive summary, the clean version of the rule and the red line, but I can give you what was submitted to the Supreme Court in their report oh, and recommendation. So it's perfect. a little bit more robust. That's and yet great. I'm gonna add you as the advisor for that draft uh, for that drafting team. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, anything, anything else on this? Actually, let me just say thank you for having such a very um, uh, comprehensive and thoughtful discussion about this topic. Um, the board is wise to hand these things off to you. So I look forward to the discussion in February. Thank, thanks, Randall. Appreciate that. And uh, you know, uh, these are these are complicated uh, matters, and they're one of the uh, intellectual challenges that I think draws us all uh, here to COPRAC and having the opportunity to to uh, work on these types of matters. So um, we're appreciative of the opportunity. Uh, why don't we take a uh, 10 minute break to 345. And then um, realistically, we're probably only gonna have time to um, get to the client file release and retention opinion. Um, yeah, if, if we have time, we could start the illegal contract provision, but I'm not sure that that's gonna happen today. So why don't we take 10 minutes and then start with 19 triple over four. Great. So next up is 19004, and I'm not sure who uh, is going to introduce this, but um, is that going to be you, Hunter, or somebody else? I think technically I'm the lead drafter. Um, obviously, Dina has done a ton of work, so has Ken, so I, I guess I'll leave it to you, but I think technically I'm the lead drafter. Dina, is that correct? Yeah, Hunter. I mean, I thought we discussed that you would you right. would accept it if you're comfortable if you feel comfortable with that. Sorry, it's been a couple of we were gonna. I know it has been a little while since we dug into it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel comfortable doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we talked about just sort of asking some of the points, and then we would probably take it back for final revisions, and like that we weren't prepared to vote anything out today for further comment. I think that's where we were. Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So, and you know, obviously, uh, I'm sure. Um, others on the subcommittee are going to chime in and offer their thoughts because I know we were going to take this up last meeting and uh, we've just had so much going on um, that certain things have been kicked. So um, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Um, so yeah, take it away, Hunter, and then um, hopefully we can get some feedback from the committee and um, we'll get this closer to final. All right, so some of the comments uh, that we, we got kind of took issue with our use of you know prior client or former client there is the possibility that a current client could have closed client files with that attorney so one of the things we wanted to do is kind of clarify that and refer to them as closed client files as opposed to former client files and um, we could kind of work that in throughout or we could just kind of put it out there once that when we're talking about those files, that's what we're talking about. I think that that's more uh, form than substance, but we don't want it to be confusing. So I think that I could probably go through and just say closed client files wherever we have former client or anything of that nature. One of the, um, one of the comments that we had was on this page one, and I don't know if it's, uh, if it's highlighted in your draft that you've got there. No, it looks like it's not. Page one, there's this sentence, uh, at a minimum, a lawyer should not initiate. We took that out because there was, um, there was a concern that we say like, this is what the standard should be. And then we say, but at a minimum, which kind of lowers the standard then. 
And at, at, for the most part, that just creates an ambiguity. If we're gonna tell them what should be done, then saying at a minimum just makes it unclear what's really expected. So I think we all agreed to remove the sentence that starts at a minimum and ends with, with whichever is longest. One of the major comments that we got had to do with the inclusion, and I know I'm kind of jumping ahead here, the inclusion of a discussion of essentially the, the prosecution's duty of keeping client files. The commenting party basically saying that doesn't matter. Right, that's, that's its own thing. It shouldn't be part of this opinion. The subcommittee, I think, was all on the same page with the idea that it was contextual. It was necessary context to understand the criminal defense attorney's requirements for maintaining client files. And so we decided that we were going to leave that in. We're not gonna be taking that out. On page three, there's a reference to the California Supreme Court editing the comments, the California Rules of Professional Conduct 1.6, 3.8. Um, and we noted that there were specific changes. And one of the commenting parties suggested that we should enumerate, enumerate those changes or specify those amendments. And that's something I think we were going to take to the committee at large, but we were of the opinion that we probably should specify those amendments uh, within the text here. And Dina, do I have that right? Am I remembering that correctly? That was kind of what we decided on. Um, yeah, maybe in a footnote, they wanted to say specifically. I mean, we said operative amendments and it was really edited. We kind of tried to clarify that. We thought we didn't think it was necessary, but we could specifically say what those changes were in a footnote that that would be fine to do. Right. Um, so I, I wanted to ask the committee to, if, if the committee thinks that that's a good idea to include those specific amendments. Can I suggest that we change it from edited comments to approve revisions to comments? They didn't really edit it. I mean, they are the ones who approve the editing, but I think that makes sense, maybe. I mean, we took the suggestion of, I think, one of the bar associations who didn't like the language made operative amendments. So. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Mimi. Yeah. Comments of reform, I'm not exactly sure for or of two two yeah two. two i guess it's another two yeah I, I was trying to avoid a two but i think it's fine so then i think that was one of the questions right hunter to the committee is like whether we people think in the footnote we need to expressly state what those amendments are and track them or or not <clears throat> this is you're talking about footnote four, right? No, not not, not adding a footnote. Right, oh, adding, adding a footnote. Adding a footnote that that explains what those uh, approved revisions are. Well, can can I suggest? Um, draft it, draft it up, see what it looks like. And then once we see it, we can decide if we want to keep it in or not as a footnote. You're, you're just talking about a footnote that references the comments or explains the comments or quotes from them. 
Yeah, it, I'd like to know if the committee thinks that's necessary or, or thinks we should have it. I, I can draft a, a proposed footnote. We just wanted some way in on whether they think that whether the committee thinks that's something that would be helpful to the reader. I, you know, rather than debate whether to have the footnote um, right now, maybe maybe we could have that just kind of proposed footnote for next time, and then we can decide whether we like it or not. Gotcha. And speaking of footnotes, footnote four, there was a, a slight problem with this quotation. I believe I found the right quotation, which should be um, study the issue of closed client file release and retention by defense attorneys and prosecutors in criminal cases. And that's that mention to and prosecutors is another reason why we had decided against the recommendation to remove the prosecutor client file or file retention policies as well. And to make clear in the first, in the issue outline at the beginning, the first question presented, we had how long is a lawyer ethically obligated to retain? And we had client files in a closed civil and criminal matter, and we just took out the client. So obligation to retain files in a closed civil and criminal matter. One of the reasons was that we wanted to make clear that like the issues that were in our out, this is covered by that, not just client files, but obligations in general with respect to files. Okay. Then moving down to page four, there was some discussion as to the um, contents of a file, what constitutes a file. And I'm looking for the comment that we were discussing with regard to electronic communications. Well, I think that the, someone criticized that what we referred to, what we said, while not exhaustive, the following are typically considered part of a client's form or file. And someone took issue with the phrase typically considered when we were talking about electronic files and digital data. And we so we clarified, right, Hunter, that we said intangible data concerning the matter. So we weren't talking about like every single piece of, you know, data, but that obviously concerning the matter would be part of the client file. Like if you have an electronic communication concerning the matter, it would it would be. And we didn't we we didn't think it, there was a problem saying that was typically considered part of the client file, but maybe there would be a difference of opinion on with committee members. Right, and one of them was something like, uh, I think one of the comments was, when, when have text messages ever been considered part of the client file or something along those lines? And to use typically would be overbroad here. And by removing that, um, or by adding you know, pertinent to the, to the matter, we were able to, I think, take care of that concern because not every single text message you get from a client needs to be, uh, provided to the client at some point in the future if it's you know merry christmas or something along those lines but communications via text message that are concerning the matter would probably be part of the, the file unless anybody disagrees Or do people feel like that there needs to be more? I mean, we were trying to differentiate that from sort of a text message you'd have with your client, like, where is what time does the mediation start? You know, 1030 or something where we wouldn't consider that that would be something, you know, concerning the matter that would just be a communication that would be out. But so, you know, we are trying to, to, to make that distinction, but I don't know if people feel that that's sufficient or there should be more language or if it's not a concern. Well, if if you're saying that a text message, um, you know, what times the mediation doesn't concern the matter, I play devil's advocate here. I could see somebody saying, well, of course it concerns the matter. It's a question about the mediation and blah, blah, blah. And so then, it, you know, we get into this whole debate about what's the client file and blah, 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 that 
we're trying to, I think, uh, <laughs> avoid. Well, um, I, that's probably a bad example, but I, I, you know, we didn't feel like the language saying that these are typically considered was definitive to say like it absolutely in all circumstances is every piece of, you know, where we weren't absolute on that. We didn't have a problem with the language, but maybe others did. So. Yeah, I thought the intent was, you know, once again, you know, if it's about the anything have to do with the case, that's concerned to matter. If it's, hey, did you have a nice holiday or whatever, then that stuff like that is not. Better example, yes. <laughs> Justin, do you think that the language concerning the matter is too open to ambiguity or a fight later on? You know, where's where's the text message where you told me what time this stuff is because you gave me the wrong time and something happened and then we get into a fight about what concerning the matter means so uh, the short answer is maybe i'm kind of i have two internal questions to myself and i don't know the answer um, but I'll, uh, I'll look at it and maybe others will too but you know just trying to understand um either in the the rule addressing client files or maybe the case law what what's the formulation is is it is it do they use words like concerning the matter or is there some other um diction that might be more precise or more consistent with what we see in the rule or the case law that we might want to use or alternatively again this is just internally in my thought process i'm wondering if we just avoid the 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 discussion by uh, omitting the um, including emails, text messages, or other SMS messages, and not even get into the examples. Is it enough um, guidance to just say intangible data um, in the form of electronic files and digital data um, and avoid the discussion altogether? So, um, but I, I see the, the pitfalls of that as well. So, um, I, I want to give some more thought to personally. To this, and I'll try to have you know better two cents to give you um, when we talk about it in uh, in February. What what do others think about that? I mean, I when we talked about, it, I mean, I think you know keeping text message all that is is appropriate to keep that in there, especially given the comment from somebody. You know, why would you know since when is a text message part of the client file? Like, you know, to the extent you're texting your client or your client's texting you about the case, uh, no reason why that wouldn't be part of the file. So if we kind of delete that and just say intangible data, that's kind of open up, you know, what does that mean? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it creates more confusion. And, and the part of the reason why you're turning over the file is to you know, present the whole chronology of the case, you know, those communications, you know, what time is the mediation or what, you know, th that just tells the story of, of the whole representation. So when there's gaps, um, I just, I just, you know, from even from a risk management perspective, um, I find it, I, I think that, you know, there's like things like that should not be excluded from a file. Um, although I don't think attorney and client should be texting each other anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what, yeah, but I mean, it's, what would be the difference? You send your client a letter saying, hey, the mediation scheduled for this, right. at this location. That's part of the client file. Right. You send that in an email. I think that would be part of the client file. And if for whatever reason you do it in a text message, so I, attorney's gonna have I, to I don't start. know what an SMS message is, but... Or like attorneys gonna have to start printing their text messages or screenshots of their text messages though, recreating a a like a standard. <laughs> well, if it is, if they if that's where how they primarily communicate with their clients, then yeah. I mean, if they don't yeah. want to produce their text messages, then they shouldn't text with clients. I mean, I think okay. that's I wasn't sure if that's people. what attorneys did or not. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, again, I think a lot of people don't like to because of that reason, because then it just sort of opens that up as like, oh, now this is a further platform that which I would have to include as part of the client file. Um, but we're emailing, right? And so what texting is the same, but different. So we now have to, emails are clearly part of the client file. I think we all agree with that. So if you text your client regularly about matters concerning the representation, then that would be part of the client file. I, I don't see how that should be terribly in dispute, but 
you know, I, it's, um, you know, so that's why I just was kind of struck by that. But I do think we could see if there's other, um, you know, if there's other opinions or on this issue to say differently, but I, I'm not aware of any authority that suggests that that communication and that type of a format is not part of the client file. It's a client communication. And, and I, I would, I would agree. And I'd go so far as to say, just in my personal experience, if, if a, I've got, I've of course have my work cell phone. Um, you don't want to be communicating with uh, criminal uh, witnesses uh, with your personal cell phone, but I've gotten text messages from witnesses on my work cell phone. And, you know, they'll say something exculpatory. I screenshot it and I email it directly from that phone. Here's the screenshot. This is what it is. It's absolutely a part of that file. So um, I, I don't think that, that that those being part of the client file is really um, at issue so much as how do we say it so that attorneys understand that we're not saying any text message you ever send to your client or receive from your client uh, places a burden on you. Well, I think what we were, you know, and now that I'm remembering our conversation, which was a little while ago, Hunter and Ken about this, that the concerning the matter also dealt with this concept of like, Every time you have, like, and I'm not an IT person, like the metadata and all these different types of things, if you have like, that that wouldn't be something that you'd have to consider as part of the client file. Like here's every version that's in some of this electronic format. So we were trying to say this data that's related to the matter, not like um, these other types of things that <laughs> are electronic encryptions and things like that, that don't necessarily concern the matter that could be relevant in another context, but not necessarily as part of the client file, if that makes sense. Does, does that ring a bell with the discussion? Yes. Yeah. So, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to suggest that um, I I do what Justin suggests and um, look at other opinions and look at um, opinions on what what client files contain and see if there is more specific language that would be in the ballpark of this concerning the matter and maybe I can craft something that that avoids any kind of ambiguity. It, you know, another thing I think I was reacting to is, oh, by golly, you know, what what are lawyers going to say when they read, you know, here's from Coprac ex explicitly, hey, guess what, everybody, your text messages are part of the client file. You, you need to consider preserving those, turning them over, et cetera. And it's not that that's wrong, but I think it's gonna have a, a reaction to average Joe or Jane lawyer. And I'm wondering if we wanna back up our statement here with a citation. I mean, there's all sorts of ethics opinions uh, that talk about, hey, guess what? If you choose to text message with your client, um, you know, it's discoverable. It might be part of the client file, just like an email. So I'm wondering if you want to back that up, you know, for our own kind of PR purposes. So it's not just GoPrac telling you this out of the blue without citation. Everybody knows, folks, that text messages can be part of the client file. So maybe we can add a citation here in a footnote. That's that's kind of a that's a capital idea, and I, I don't think that should be hard to find. So that's, that's well, I will I say in the main substance of the rule that, you know, E, E2, I mean, um, uh, 116 E2, when we're E1, when we're talking about the file itself, it references correspondence and in any form, tangible, electronic, or other form. So, you know, I think the rule itself makes that point. It certainly says that. We, you're not obligated to create an electronic file where one doesn't exist, which we've cited, you know, copied that citation to that. But I, um, you know, we can certainly look to other things. I, I don't know that a communication with a client in whatever format I, is not part of the client file. It's, it's, I think, part of the rule, and the rule contemplates that in an electronic format as well. But, well, I, I agree with that. And, and, uh, I'm, I'm making a slightly different point, which is that your average lawyer who's not as in tune with what the client file is and these issues, it's gonna be like, oh boy, Coprac, it doesn't say that in the rule, it's vague. And now they're telling me text messages explicitly are part of the file. Oh man, I, I wanna just, I just wanna back that up. Hey, it's not just Coprac telling you this. There's no way around 
you can as a lawyer, you know, you crafty lawyer, you can't try to interpret the rule to not include text messages. Everybody knows the text messages are a communication with the client and you, and you might need to turn them over. So that's, that's, that's the kind of PR standpoint I'm coming from. Not that I disagree um, with what the rule uh, encompasses. I think that, that that might get a lot of um, uh, attention um, because I don't think uh, we've really, unless I'm missing it in, in prior opinions or recent opinions, kind of highlighted. Didn't get that much stuff. in the last comments. So I think it was just that one person commented some of the effects. Since when is a text message? Part yeah, of we just had yeah, the one it, comment. Yeah, and I think your average lawyer might think that too. That's what I'm saying. Is you know maybe none of us think that. For your average lawyer, wait a minute, I got to preserve text messages. They're probably not reading ethics opinions about whether text messages are part of a client file. So when they read this, in our opinion, and, uh, you know, ideally we can have a footnote that, that makes it clear, look, this is, we're not coming out of the blue here, folks. Um, this, this is, this is, we're trying to give you good solid guidance that's correct and consistent with every jurisdiction, um, including California and how you need to fairly interpret the client file rule to ensure that you preserve and, and provide your text messages if you are so um, inclined to communicate with your client that way. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I just, just a little anecdote. I was talking to a client yesterday and he, he was saying he turned, the representation ended a month or a year ago and he said, oh, I turned over my file and we were talking about emails. He's like, well, I didn't turn over all the emails because they, you know, my client has a copy of those. And, and I was like, no, you have to, you have to turn over all of, you know, so they don't even know, so, you know, some, some lawyers, not even just text messages, but some lawyers just think, well, they were emails sent to my client. They have them. So why is it part of the file? You know, so it's that they don't read the ethics rules and opinions. <laughs> I know, but with that logic, it's like the same thing. I sent my client a letter, so they have it. So why I know a copy I'm, of it. I mean, it's like you know. I know. I know. Sometimes, like, it's yeah, doing our job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So I mean, I it just it, it's probably good to be more clear than. Yeah, um, I think the text the texting presents problems for attorneys that have use their their phone for work and for personal and then the idea that if they had to copy a client file then something like how does their firm have access to downloading that and if they you know so it creates those types of problems which is why i understand attorneys don't you know would be not want to have to do something besides what uh hunter's describing screenshot and send it which is a very good practice to do but um you know the alternative is to not do it right <laughs> to not text with your clients and keep it in emails but yeah. And and some of the, you know, if you just kind of Google this, it's definitely come up in other jurisdictions. You know, there's blogs about it, ethics blogs, and and some of them will just, they'll blatantly say that once your client has your cell phone number, they're going to text you. Yeah. And they will text you at all hours of the night. They will text you books worth of information. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe the best practice, which we won't include in this would be get a work phone for that. But or don't give them your cell phone number. Like don't give them your cell phone number. Okay, so um, moving down, if you look at footnote six there, uh, somebody, uh, was it LACPA or was it, um, well, in any case, somebody took issue with the idea that work product, uncommunicated work product would be included in the client file. And they provided a number of situations where they say, well, look, clearly this would be included in the client file. But the fact is the, the authority that we've been able to find, the authority that uh, both Amber included in here and then I was shepherdizing and looking at it, it really does say that this is an open question. Does it make sense that this open question would be eventually resolved in favor of uncommunicated work product being part of the client file? Yes, because if it's work product, then you were probably working on something. And if, it, if you were billing the client for it, which presumably you would be, it's something that probably matters, right? And you're supposed to be turning over things that actually um, 
would would matter to the client. So when you look at this, just kind of from a logical standpoint, yes, this is probably included in a client file, but officially it's, it's not decided yet. So I'd like the committee to weigh in. I'm, I don't, I don't think it's really our, or maybe it is, but it didn't seem like our duty to kind of make this question no longer an open question and say we're going to decide what the courts have not decided which is that this is in fact part of the client file i think what they took issue with was that formulation of the verbs and the first sentence of that where we said it may be under these circumstances if it was reasonably necessary uh, to avoid reasonably foreseeable prejudice to the client where and under those circumstances it would be right but it's not in, in, in most circumstances, not every piece of uncommunicated attorney work product would fall into that category of something that's necessary to avoid reasonably foreseeable prejudice to the client. So I think we thought we should say that first sentence should be would be considered because under those circumstances, I think we agreed that that would be something that's part of the client file because it's necessary to avoid prejudice to them, right? So we form the formulation of that probably the maybe isn't strong enough under that circumstance, it would be. But then we describe circumstances that not all in not all cases work product would be part of the client file, and I think we describe that and I think that OCBA made a good point, which was just that we should make a note to say that whether we conclude it's part of the client file that needs to be returned the attorney may still have an obligation to retain it, which would be something that I think is worth noting in that as a point to that so. Um, I don't think we need to change the what we've described is like you said hunter this sort of unresolved issue about and wonder what circumstances it's part of the client file and that it isn't but that our first sentence was problematic which i would agree with and, and that that point that they made i think so, i think their phrasing was something like we can't imagine a situation in which it wouldn't be but but the the points they made that what i think were valid is one in this situation described like you said it would be and then two regardless of whether it would be it should be retained um but we were also first comment was was uh, that one was mine because i once again I, I went through it and i couldn't think of a situation where work product that's necessary to avoid pre reasonable prejudice the client wouldn't be and we couldn't as we kind of bandied it about we couldn't come up with one either and that's and that was kind of distinct from the uncommunicated issue because that was just kind of a general statement that work product may be part of the for, for, uh, client's file. So we, I, think, it, I still we have I just know we still have former in there, but yeah. I don't. Uh, go, go ahead. Hunter. I was just going to say it could be that I just read more into certain language from uh, the OCBA, but I think that these two recommendations essentially uh, what's here um, would be sufficient to deal with that with that comment. I don't think that we would get further comments if we if we make the changes that are here. Yeah, I just had one additional comment on the, on this footnote six. Um, I agree with the conclusion um, that attorney work product that's reasonably necessary uh, that's necessary to avoid reasonably foreseeable prejudice uh, would need to be provided to the client. But then some of the ethics opinions we're citing aren't necessarily consistent with that statement. Um, you know, the, the, I forget which ethics opinion, I'm not see work product for which the client can be billed belongs to the client. Um, and then there's, I don't think they're all talking about the reasonably necessary um, condition. So we might just want to reconsider whether we need all those ethics opinions or just the ones that are addressing the the, talk, the ones that talk about whether it's, it's reasonably necessary to avoid foreseeable prejudice. I think the parenthetical explanations of the opinions, while not directly on point with that sentence, do provide some necessary context and it gives readers the ability to kind of look at what else may be uh, lurking in the background. Um, so I would kind of be in favor of keeping them, but. I, I had some, the, the, the San, I think it's the San Diego one that says, um, 
Although client not entitled to attorney's absolute work product, such as those are as recommended as a matter of professional ethics and courtesy. I know we're talking, we talk about this many times, but like in terms of best practices and stuff, it, it just sounds like we're endorsing that, that viewpoint perhaps as, you know, that the failure to do so could constitute discipline, even though it seems like that's really just a, a best practice. Right. We would be conveying essentially a best practice instead of, I see what you're saying. Well, what if we put that, um, well, I don't know, the second sentence, whether a lawyer is obligated to release um, to the former client, the attorney work product not previously, if we put that as the second sentence in the footnote and then had some of these citations. I mean, I agree with you, Sarah, that we're, we're, we're sort of saying now if we change it and say that it would be considered and then we just sort of string cite to some opinions that have reached different conclusions in general about work product, it doesn't necessarily hold together as to the point that we're trying to support. But we can work on that maybe. Yeah, there. maybe even just, yeah, I think moving the location of the ones that aren't directly on point um, would, would be useful. So yeah. they don't follow that sentence. So moving them essentially to the, uh, how the open question should or would be decided is beyond the scope of this opinion. Well, maybe we should work on that offline and then should, we're probably running out of time. We probably need to hit uh, bigger questions. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just um, offer one thought here as you're deciding how to reformulate this. It struck me in the wording that there are two different concepts going on here. Um, and I think we need to look, actually look at what the opinions say and the, the, the ethics opinions and the case opinions. So the first sentence is just making the point that attorney work product, product is part of the file, okay? That's all that's saying if you read it literally. But then the citations there are talking about not whether or not work product is part of the file, but whether it has to be turned over and, or not in certain circumstances, or if you look at the, the um, parentheticals there. So there are two different concepts here. One. Okay, is attorney work part, part of the client file? Yes or no? And then two, with respect to uncommunicated work product, okay, whether or not it's part of the file, it doesn't have to be turned over. And obviously for the latter, as we know with the Rose case, it's, it's an open question. So, you know, as you're looking at the language here, note that there are two different concepts and I'm not sure in the first sentence, if what we're saying, which is just attorney work product is part of a client file, it jibes with the citations there, which are talking about whether attorney work product has to be turned over in, in what circumstance, which is a different concept. Yeah, I, I, as I'm looking at this again, too, I noticed this in that first sentence, parts of it are quoted. I don't know where those quotes come from, that San Diego bar opinion. Yeah, I think we, so as in reformulating this, I, I think yeah. we just need to look back at what, what these opinions actually say, and then in turn, what are we trying to say? Yeah. Okay. I just had one quick question. I, I was just looking at the rule um, again, and I thought this is raised in the public comments too. We still have the language in here necessary to avoid reasonably foreseeable prejudice to the client, but the rule uses that rule 1.16 E1 uses the term reasonably necessary to the client's representation and talks about it doesn't matter whether the client paid for it or not, to, which to me conflicts with what one of the ethics opinions here says that the LA County ethics opinion. That's why I was questioning those quotes, because we have that reasonably foreseeable to prejudice the client in quotes, and I don't know why. I think that's from a different rule, um, the rule about withdrawing from representation, a different subsection, I thought. Let me just... Um, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, we need to check all that. All right, so work on this entire footnote and get our... Uh, figure out what we're trying to say and then exactly which authorities support it. Okay. 
I have one other question. I'm sorry not, not to spend too much time, but I, I wanted to understand um, the Orange County Bar Association comment about the tech that I think we're considering incorporating may have an obligation to retain it. Um, it might be helpful to provide some more detail there if we're going to say that. Um, under what circumstances would there be an obligation to retain or there's not necessarily an obligation to return it to the client? I mean, I think that goes, I mean, we'll have to look at the comment in more detail. I think it goes to that sort of open-ended question about like, what are you returning a client file? But then for the purposes of like, um, you know, if there was a malpractice claim, you have to retain everything related to the representation um, and so why wouldn't those be in the same subset, right? Like, why would they be, there'd be different standards for returning a client file versus what you have an obligation to retain. But, um, we will have to look at what the comment said and if they provide any support or authority for that and what circumstances that would be. But I think that's generally the concept, although we'd have to sort of think about examples and where that would apply. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Some issues with that in the past where, you know, lawyers have billed for doing some research and then, but they haven't reduced that to writing anywhere. And, you know, that was, you know, that comes up in some billing disputes and that, you know, and then it gets, is that work product when we talk, you know, when they say you have an obligation to retain it, well, if it's only in your head, that's a more practical issue. Do you have an obligation, you know, is that saying you have an obligation to, if you've researched something develop some, you know, your, your thoughts and opinions on that, but you haven't committed it to paper? Do you have now have an obligation to put it on paper and retain it for the client? Uh, kind of a can of worms there, but. But we can look at that whole, that whole footnote there. All right, I'm gonna uh, move down to the next page. Uh, there was some 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 commentary regarding uh, making the digest more consistent with the rest of the opinion. So we we're thinking about adding the uh, reference to returning a client file, um, consistent with it being noted in the digest down on page uh, six. And then Ken, you had a, a comment. I don't see where it is. You had a comment on page six in the intrinsically valuable items original settlement agreements um is that something i don't remember discussing that is that something that we were going to add um you, you're testing my memory here <laughs> i don't recall the discussion but I, I have generally you know when you know in terms of what i've always done and involves advised in terms of intrinsically value yeah you know an original settlement agreement you know i've always considered that's something that should be you know, maintain so you don't get into issues. If there's an enforcement down the road, you know, is a copy sufficient or you need to have the originals? That was only my thought process on that, so. All right. Then there was a, an addition down in footnote eight to add the five-year retention requirement. Does anybody have any issues with that addition? All right, I'll move right along. Going down to page seven. The There is a, a mention of circumstances in which a client file may need to be retained past the client's life. And I think without really meaning to, I've at least been seeing the life of the client as kind of the longest term and, and possibly also the shortest term. But um, we got a San Diego Bar Association comment that gave some examples or, or at least suggested that there may be situations in which a client file must be retained beyond the life of the client. Uh, Ken thought that maybe the examples were a little bit down in the weeds. And I thought that that's true, but I think that when you 
when you have that balance, it may be workable to add a footnote where you suggest, hey, there might be these limited situations. Here's an example of when. So, and this is a first paragraph under duties of defense counsel. Um, essentially before the, uh, before the citation, starting with the CalBar formal opinion 2000, or, yeah. Are you, uh, Hunter, are you saying uh, the next, for next meeting, we'll draft up a footnote? And then yes, yes, that, that's, that's what I plan to do. Perfect. Um, you know, unfortunately we're at 430, so we got to stop. Um, but I think that uh, hopefully you've gotten some feedback here. Um, if anyone else had additional comments that we can get to, you can send it to um, to Hunter and maybe he can be the point person for sharing that with the subcommittee. Um, I have a couple of thoughts that, I, that I'll send you, Hunter. Thank you. Um, as a means to move this along for next meeting as well. And then let's plan to um, you know, pick this up um, with uh, whatever additional revisions you have then. Um, does, that, does that work? That works. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, this was a, a very full and productive meeting. Um, hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Uh, uh, Bye. Bye to Cassidy's cat too. <laughs> <laughs>